This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is three minutes after ten, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. What what would you do? What 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 would you put on this list first? Things that we should, things that you should, or we should we do we? Let's do we, not you. Things that we should know more about. Things that we should talk about more. Um, there's there's a weird dynamic involved in our time together every day because the stuff that is most important is not necessarily the stuff that makes for the most. Uh, and and engaging, I never mind enjoyable times together. Do, do you see what I mean? It's, it's why Thomas finishes doing the news at ten o'clock in the morning, and we don't immediately start talking about the the, the three stories that have been adjudged to be the three most important. The, the, I mean, I, I know this is a statement of the bleeding obvious, but it, it, it some days comes into sharper focus than it does on other days. What, what what could possibly be more important than senior military figures warning? of some fairly hefty problems on our rather close horizon. Um, As a former NATO chief has joined their numbers today, saying that it is time to think the unthinkable and consider bringing back conscription to deter Russia from all-out war. It's, it's, I think the news agents discussed this uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, Jack was listening, and he says it's more preparing the country to deal with a war, James. We need more paramedics and mechanics, etc. It has been generations since we had to think about how we as a country would deal with a live battlefront on or near our borders. Well, you can say that again. He has also questioned, uh, in a letter to the Times... He has also questioned the Ministry of Defence's preparedness for war of a, and and to quote him, of a scale and ferocity that would engulf this country if NATO had to defend one of its member states under Article 5. So this would involve Russia uh, doing to a NATO state what it has done in Ukraine and the treaty kicking in and all NATO members therefore being um, uh, compelled to join in, as it were, to to repel Russian forces. And given what might happen in America later this year, you can see why perhaps some of the um, uh, uh, resolve is hardening. Now, that's my theory. I I think a fear perhaps of another Donald Trump presidency is motivating some of the concern and indeed alarm being expressed by senior military figures. And and it's not just here. Don't think for a moment that this is uh, a uniquely British thing. General Sir Richard Sheriff was the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander in Europe from 2011 to 2014. Uh, uh, the, the, the journalistic shorthand for that job is, is NATO chief, a NATO chief. Germany's defence minister has suggested that it, it might be five to eight years before there is the possibility of a war with Russia. Admiral Rob Bauer, the Dutch head of NATO's military committee, has said that there could be a war with Russia within the next 20 years, where, and I quote again, it is the whole of society which will get involved, whether we like it or not. This, of course, um, comes as the Swedish government is about to join NATO and has just reintroduced a form of national service. One of the things about the topics that we should be talking about more. One of the reasons I think why we don't is they immediately feel so enormous. Do you know what I didn't even remember to tell you about yesterday? And I just got reminded of it then when I saw that slightly clumsy-looking word preparedness uh, in in the newspaper article that I'm currently consulting, a rather splendid column, characteristically splendid column in The Guardian today by Gabby Hinsliff. Uh, In 2024, the headline reads, Peace is a luxury we can no longer take for granted. And that's going to form... Uh, a foundation of the conversation that we're going to have first today. But uh, that word preparedness, do you know what I forgot to tell you yesterday? They they think that we are now less well prepared for a pandemic than we were before the last one. Can you believe that? I, I, I mean, listen, uh, the, the, the way the media works is weird. I, I, I completely understand why stories that will provoke an enormous emotional reaction uh, trump stories that are obviously and objectively much more important. But I can't believe how little coverage. In fact, I, I, I'm going to have to dig it out of the archives from yesterday. Can we find that article about us not being ready for the pandemic? It being less ready for another pandemic than we were ready for the last one. Just just try that for size. Go on, take a moment now. Just put that on like a pair of socks. Try that story on for size. Well, where's your jaw now? You what, James? With less... But how... Bit... 
the, so it's just too big. We 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 sit there to the um, uh, I, 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 sort of awed by the scale of that story. Do you see what I mean? You just go like, how do you even get started on something like that? And I feel a bit similar about this one, but 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 get started, we will. One of the interesting things about Matters Military is that there are quite a lot of people who have a deep and abiding interest in it. It's, it's an area of genuine enthusiasm for people who have and have not done or are doing military service. Uh, uh, quite a lot of people do follow events as closely as we all should. And and I'm I'm relying on you if you're in that category today to help the rest of us out at least a little bit but it is it is this story really that intrigues me most it's this combination of senior military figures now warning that a war with russia and that would to most intents and purposes constitute a world war is 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 looking likely i think um uh, there's another one a form the army chief general sir patrick sanders has said has called for preparatory steps to enable placing our societies on a war footing he he also warned that civilians would have to volunteer for the front line if russia began invading nato countries and uh, gabby hinsliff writes in the guardian today not knowing what was going to appear in the times she says at least he stopped short of calling for the reintroduction of conscription and then i turn to the times newspaper and i read a former nato chief suggesting that we might have to have conscription he says to most professional soldiers myself included conscription is anathema however if deterrence is to be effective russia deterred and catastrophe averted it might be necessary so I, I i think the question is what's going on it's a it's a marvin gay morning once again but but we need a little bit more focus than that perhaps I, I, how has this happened as someone who follows these matters perhaps more closely than i do how has this happened and why is this happening now i'm not completely stupid i can see how the aggression on display in ukraine is pertinent to the bigger picture but it has been widely regarded at least in the opening salvos as fairly catastrophic for putin the expectation of a swift and decisive victory was was scotched uh, in the course of the first weekend where is it coming from this uh, fear and how I, 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 do you know? Actually, I've, I've got to apologise to somebody. A pal of mine was over from Australia, just literally, just changing flights at Heathrow and came into Hammersmith for lunch. I haven't seen it for ages, and quite a lot of people convened upon this pub in Hammersmith to, to 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 break bread with her. But we didn't all know each other, and one of the people there who works on the entertainment side of television said oh i was so glad when i heard you were coming because i really want to know how worried i should be about world war three and i thought she was bonkers it turns out she was actually paying more attention to the news than i was this is only about a week ago i think it may even have been a week ago today and and so that idea that this conversation is already unfolding in spaces gabby hinsliff's piece in the guardian today talks about cyber warfare um what would happen to the country if somehow they succeeded in switching stuff off how long could you survive without your mobile phone and and you know everything is in your mobile phone these days uh, from your bank account to your to your to your to your route home so what is going what is going on what why are all of these voices convening on the, on the same space what why do you think that is oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three so i'll list the people again you've got german germany's defense Minister, you've got the Dutch head of NATO's military committee. You've got Sweden already reintroducing a form of national service. And if you want to understand why, in the very simplest of terms, just look at a map and look where Scandinavia sits in in the context of Russia and, and Ukraine, Finland even more uh, pertinently. So, so that's Sweden, Holland, NATO, Germany. And then we come back to Britain, where you've got the Army Chief General Sir Patrick Sanders, and you've got a former NATO Chief General Sir Richard Sheriff. Um, one stopping just short of calling for the reintroduction of conscription. One in the Times today, categorically not conscription. Uh, it, it, since since you ask, Stephen in Milton Keynes is essentially compulsory military service. It is, you, you know. You, you get a letter telling you to report to an army base at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning and that's it, you're in the army now to paraphrase status quo 
Uh, that, that's what conscription is, military service, a except that in the context of um, uh, the, the first general's comments, it would only happen in the event of war actually happening. Uh, volunteering to go to the front, front line. I, I, crikey, I, I'm 52. I don't think it would, it would come to that, but it, it does rather focus the mind, doesn't it? So why is it happening now, and how worried should we be? 13 minutes after 10 is the time. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need. While you get your act together and start ringing me, I'll just share this other story with you that is, frankly, extraordinary. Um, the, the, the UK is less prepared for a pandemic than it was before the COVID crisis after driving away jab manufacturers and relying on a narrow range of ch shots. This comes from Dr. Clive Dix, who literally chaired the UK's vaccine task force. He told MPs on Wednesday that all of the work done to ensure that the UK was better equipped with vaccines had, had fallen to pieces. He said all the activities were literally gone. There'd been a complete demise. Tories still marching around the room. Uh, claiming that they played an absolute blinder on these fronts. But, of course, they, 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 they acted uh, urgently and accidentally correctly without doing any of the legwork or the, or the heavy lifting necessary to ensure that we were in a better position next time it happens than we were last time. Who's surprised? Hands up if you're surprised. No, exactly. So, so that, that's the kind of story that f plays into the military one. This, this sort of blithe, uh, blasé lack of understanding and knowledge and we today will do our well, we'll do our best to fill in some of the gaps in 2024 peace is a luxury we can no longer take for granted it writes one columnist this morning uh, a former military uh, chief writes to the times suggesting that we m may need to revive conscription to scare off russia why is this happening now and how have we ended up in this situation it is coming up to quarter past ten. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The number you need, as always, is 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 10 is the time. And I, listen, I know the Daily Express isn't necessarily an arbiter of uh, uh, sober and objective reporting, but just as an indication of the noise that I've sought to describe already this morning, they currently have uh, an article on their website under the following headline, UK Army Conscription, Age and Rules as NATO Prepares for World War Three with Russia. So I, I think asking, well, what's exactly going on here is um, probably... Quite important. Let's start in Ilkley. Gareth is there. Gareth, what would you like to say? Morning, James. How are you doing? You all right. Good, um, I wasn't going to call you. I wasn't going to call you today, but it, it, it was. I just um, switched on the radio and heard you talking about it. I think so. That I is generally how it works, Gareth. You realise? Yeah, that. I know. That's, yeah, that's I'm the... getting that. I'm getting that. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so I think I think your question was why is it happening now? Yes, one of my. Um, I think there's a there's a few things going on. Uh, I think the first thing is we've basically been caught with our you know what's down. We've we've underinvested. All this has happened on our doorstep. Blah blah blah. We realise we're not. We've looked at Ukraine, and sustained conflict is yes. not something we are are ready for. We are ready for surgical strikes in the middle east taking out some guys that don't fight back use a couple of missiles and leave it we're not you know if you look at ukraine it's basically gone back to world war one world war two uh, warfare hasn't it it's throwing mortars at each other yes uh, and just slogging enough stuff and see who who can weather it out we don't have the stockpiles we don't and one thing ukraine has shown us is you need manpower to, to sustain a war and that's their biggest problem at the moment uh, as well as obviously the equipment thing. Yes. So you've got that. Then you've got to look at the Americans. And before you even worry about Trump, because I think, I think now that is something to do with it, the Americans... Well, any being, conversation involving NATO has to take into account the fact that a man who may be the next president of America has, yep. has no understanding of its importance or indeed commitment to its role. Yep. But I think, I think it's beyond that, James. I think, assume for a minute that Trump isn't the next president... Uh, or the next few presidents isn't like a Trump-like president. Yeah, um, they are pressured in every single sphere of influence by uh, a, 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 like a conglomerate of countries that seek to topple them from the top. They are being pressured in Taiwan. They are being pressured around Korea. They are being pressured in every sphere of influence they have. And I don't think that the Americans are confident that they have the ability to protect Europe anymore, because the minute it kicks off. In Europe, for example, we're talking about Russia, 
um, all of those people that are secretly hoping to topple the Americans from their top spot. Mm. You know, well, well the, China, the, the minute it kicks off in Europe, the Chinese are going to attack Taiwan. I think most people would ta- see that. Taiwan is the, is the sort of cradle of technology from where um, all of the tiny computer chips that our yeah. modern uh, societies rely on come from. So just imagine if that tap got turned off overnight. Yeah, so they're facing multiple flashpoints. Their, their forces are divided, trying to protect all their spheres of influence. Supply chain is very important. And then you've got the, you know, the, you, that's even before you consider if the Americans actually want to help us. Well, yeah, I mean, under, under, under NATO treaties, they, they would have to if Russia went into a NATO member, as things stand. Yeah, but, but, but why, why, much, why now? Why, why this week of, of so many different voices all essentially said the same thing? Why, why this week, do you think? Do you, do you know, I think it's one of those situations where, like, one person says something and then yeah. everyone finally feels they can say what they actually think because the dam's been broken. It's like, you know, like, you know when you're on the tube and there's a fight, yeah. no one does anything until someone says something and then everyone helps and everyone says, that, it says you know, what they think. I think it's just it's it, it's been building up slowly, hasn't it? Um, I think so. It looks that way, and and the more you think about it, the more you talk about it, the more it, it, it seems almost inevitable that if yeah. you want, so military chiefs and ministers are discussing how they would build up a force of up to five hundred thousand troops and civilians ready to take on a country such as Russia. We're not even touching the sides of that at the moment. No, and that's before you even worry about supply chain, logistics, spare parts. What's your background? Um, yeah, are you just a, an interested observer? Just, just interested. Uh, yeah, my, I mean, I, I mean, my dad was a security clear defence contractor, so oh, okay. I used to have some interesting chats over the uh, yes. breakfast table. But um, he worked a lot with the American Air Force. He was over in you know those big those big airfields. Oh, fair enough. I did, you just seemed a little bit more um, in closer proximity to some of these issues than the average Joe. Um, although the average Joe is more than welcome to to ring in as well on this subject, not least because the presenter is an average Joe when it comes to this kind of stuff. Except, in, I suppose, I follow the news a little bit more closely than some people and and yet this one has crept up on me to, to the point where i just remembered as, as you will recall a few minutes ago i just remembered someone saying something to me which i thought was alarmist and and a little bit odd and yet here we are now the the, the military voices that have added uh, their contributions to the conversation can, almost certainly should not and cannot be ignored. It, do you see what I mean, though, about the size of the mountain? How do you start having a conversation about uh, raising a force of half a million combat-ready soldiers and civilians? It's, it feels like a, a million miles away from this country. 23 after 10 is the time. Andrew is in Trowbridge. Andrew, what would you like to say? Hello. It's a real pleasure to finally talk to you. Well, we'll see, Andrew. Let's yeah, not get carried I've been away. For quite a while. Well, welcome aboard. Okay. Um, first of all, yes. uh, if we want to stop this World War Three from happening, I think we just have to stop using oil. Well, what if Russia the money doesn't? From, sorry. What if Russia doesn't? Uh, well, I mean, Russia needs the money from where it sells oil. If we stop buying off them. They've got no money. They yeah. can't go to war. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's a thought, isn't it? But I, I, a little bit hard to implement, perhaps overnight or in, in, in time. To... We can do it quite quickly if we just so? had a grant for solar panels on every roof in the country. Okay. I mean, this has gone off in an interesting direction. So the, the way to, to confound Vladimir Putin is with solar panels. Yes. Simple, quick, and very effective. Well, I, I mean, it's certainly simple. It could be quick. But whether or not it would be effective enough... I, to, to, to replace oil overnight, I simply don't know. And you're just going to tell me that it would, and I'm going to say I still don't know. I don't want to say that I don't believe you. I just want to say it seems unlikely. Okay. Well, it's not going to replace oil overnight, but it's certainly going to reduce its usage significantly. Do Very you quickly. have any idea why all of these disparate voices have all started saying more or less the same thing in the last few days? I don't think they started in the last few days. I think a lot of people have been shouting about this for quite a while. Right. It's only just in the last few days we started listening. It started getting the coverage that, that you'd think it would demand. And, and yeah, yes. you must be right, for not least for just the anecdotal reasons that I touched upon earlier. Thank you, Andrew. I, I, I feel that I should do more. You were so pleased to get onto the programme after all this time. I, I feel that I, I, should make more, wish I should turn it into more of an event for you, but I'm not sure what I can do. One more small comment, yes. which is slightly off topic. Oh, well, okay. I did, I I did ask for it. It's, it's something which will help you out as on another topic when you'll probably come round to it. Okay, well, yeah, why not then? Go okay. on, fill your boots. Yeah, yeah. yeah fair enough. Um, part of the problem we have trying to shift off of oil yeah. is because there's so much money in oil. Yeah, I kind of knew and, that, mate. Yeah, and that money is distorting everything in the world now. And, of course, it, it, it also sees 
uh, epic news manipulation on behalf of the fossil fuel uh, industry via British media and those dreadful Tufton Street flavoured think tanks that the rest of the world is finally beginning to appreciate the invidiousness of, although it has been a, a, a lonely battle at uh, some times, uh, at some points, to, to to illustrate that. Thank you, Andrew. Twenty six minutes after ten, you've broken your duck now, mate. You can you can you can come back on whenever you want. Mike's in Manchester. Mike, what's happening? What, what's going on here? Um, so, on the subject of conscription, yes. Uh, personally, I feel that the the people who are leading these countries and the, obviously the governments of the day, yeah, if they are stoking the fires of saying oh this country is going to invade or this country is well, going to invade I, I just pause you if i can okay. i haven't i haven't quoted a politician yet all i've quoted is military profession no no i'm not i'm not saying you have but no. i mean obviously just so, on the round the whole subject kind of yeah but it's, it's not governments I, I if anything governments are delinquent governments are not go, the, the, this is this is military leaders telling governments to get their act together it's not governments trying to scare us mate you've got, got to my point <laughs> well because it's already built on on sand isn't it no, I'm saying that though, if they want to encourage people to sign up, then maybe they should be signing up as well. I like that. I mean, that's that's a, yeah. I mean, I, I guess so. We can always say that, or at least sign their children up as well. But it isn't. This is not sadly uh, an opportunity to just put the boot into politicians for being politicians. This is military professionals, lifelong military professionals, warning governments and politicians about the threat of Russia and the unpreparedness of. Western nations of nations like ours, so it's it's not it's not yet a kind of well. It's all very well sending other people's children to war, but why don't you go go yourself? You're about eight years early with this point, Mike. I think. Well, it's like Grant. Sh was it Grant Shapps the other day said, "Oh, Russia are going to so in in round terms, they're going to start World War Three, or there's going to be a massive invasion in within twenty years, or was it something like that?" I don't I know. I, I, I find Shapps. it I find Grant Shapps gratifyingly easy to ignore, but I do it's pay attention right. when some other people with with rather more military nous and knowledge make similar noises, and and they have certainly been doing that. I think that, let's pick up on two of them actually, because this is kind of important. It's tempting to just laugh it off when you see the Daily Express writing about World War Three, but you've got Germany's defence minister Boris Pistorius. It's a cool name, um, saying five to eight years possibly um, before some form of engagement with. Russia, and then you've got the Dutch head of NATO's military committee suggesting that the possibility of war with Russia within the next 20 years would see the whole of society get involved, whether we like it or not. And, and I, I suppose, in a way, the question of why this is happening now has been answered. It's, it's happening now because it's been slowly percolating. It's been slowly escalating. These concerns have been expressed and the situation in Ukraine has hardened them. And for me, as an amateurish observer, for me, the possibility of someone who is absolutely not committed to the NATO settlement becoming the president of the United States of America again would really focus the mind. Um, not least because I don't think that it is necessarily... Um, uh, controversial to suggest that Donald Trump often seems to be more aligned with the interests of Vladimir Putin than he does with the interests of your average American voter. Bless their little cotton socks. Um, if you can help out on this one, oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. What? Why is this conversation gathering pace at precisely this moment in time? And I, I don't really make any apology for asking how worried we should be. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.33 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Where the, I mean, it's a bit of a mad one, isn't it? Even the words World War III have you reaching for the smelling salts. But it, it, and, and I, I'm not sure we're best equipped, really, to contemplate these questions um, against that backdrop, against, against that sort of just shock, if you like, at the words themselves. But as I've detailed already this morning, an awful lot of very informed people are sounding worryingly similar on the prospect of war with Russia. And, and war with Russia, if it involved the invasion of a NATO country, is, is, is technically world war. And the warnings now are coming thick and fast that we are simply not ready for it. So <laughs> why? Why aren't we ready for it? What has happened? And why are all these voices converging now on the same space? Dave's in Yeovil. Dave, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Hello, uh, first time, so um, thanks for this. Welcome. Um, I think 
I think uh, a lot of this with the generals asking, uh, are talking about conscription is a little bit... I think they're just illustrating the point that yes. uh, the UK armed forces at present are um, uh, particularly low in and, and numbers, and retention is a problem as well with some elements of the armed forces. Um, I well, mean, like every frankly, other public, every other part of the public well, yeah, sector in a way, other is under-resourced, under, underfunded, low morale and, and, and high vacancies, I imagine. I can't think why that might be, James. You know? <laughs> no, <laughs> Different subject, but. I feel. It is, well, it isn't, um, it isn't, isn't it? But we'll focus on this one because it's, it's the one you know about. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I mean, basically, uh, the, the capacity to train people who, who a majority probably wouldn't want to be there isn't there. There yeah. isn't the manpower to train an excess of manpower in a short time. I hadn't thought of it um, that way around. So you throw the word conscription into the mix as as a concerned military uh, person well, we because you get forces. because I'm, you get I'm attention. Our mix, our mix, our right. forces as twenty years. But um, <laughs> the reason why we punch above our weight with the with the equipment and and the um, uh, facilities that we have. The resources that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, we punch them away, which is why you know the Americans still continue to work with us. Um, I'm not saying I'm not denigrating the, the Germans or the French or no, just in else terms of capability. The the Norwegians have all got their it? capabilities. Yes, um, but we do punch them away, which is why, for instance, I mean, it's not a couple of years ago, I comment to a company or two companies of Royal Marines ran rings around two battalions or three battalions of um, I can't remember U.S. Army, U.S. Marine Corps, and they ran rings around them. You know, purely because our training, I, I do believe, is is probably second to none. So, why, you know, why you know, do you think could... why do you think this is happening now? Why do you think these noises are being made now? I think it all comes down to money. Yes, it's um, always money. And this is my got rid of a lot of our a lot of ammunition and, and and vehicles that we've got rid of. In a way, we've saved money that way because we have it ammunition that's coming to its life X. Yeah. Hang on a second, somebody's trying to get hold of me. Well, that's all right. Don't let me detain you. Matthew's in Sleaford. Matthew, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Um, I, I think your previous caller um, made some really interesting points there. But one of the big problems that the armed forces have got more generally, and when we talk about this, we have to talk about the armed forces, not just the army, even though it's the chief of general staff that was uh, mentioning the idea of uh, increased numbers and the potential of a citizen army is in terms of recruitment and retention, the, both our forces are massive, all our forces are massively underserved in terms of their numbers. They're not hitting the numbers that have been set for them in terms of budgets and capacity, but also in terms of retention. Most people who are joining the services today do not see this as a, uh, a long-term career for them. Mm. And so you've got a lot of movement in terms of people coming in and out. You're having to retrain different people in the same jobs continuously and so you lose that capacity and that capability to perform uh, at an efficient level how i mean mean, in percentage terms how how diminished are we do you think as a military force compared to i don't know the falklands in terms of the where we were in uh, the falklands you had an army of over 100,000, yeah. uh, an air force of over forty to 50,000, and a navy over about seventy to 80,000. You're looking at an air force now, uh, which is my particular area, is right. less than 40,000. Yeah, it's, a quite, it's quite stark, isn't it? Quite an arresting it, contrast. And, and of course, it, this is not a British conversation. This mm-hmm. is a conversation that's been had across Europe and, and particularly Northern Europe, because, and, and the, the thing we haven't mentioned that we should have done is if, if Putin succeeds in Ukraine, the questions that we're asking today are kind of all variations on what would he do next, aren't they? Yeah, um, so what would he do next? Um, I, I think sort of taking on a NATO country is unlikely. No, but, but if you're in Latvia or Estonia, you can probably expect a, a sort of change in your life if if ukraine falls absolutely i think their, their security would be greatly diminished and i think it's important to remember in terms of an, a nato response is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a military response it can be diplomatic support it can be support that's short of a military effort there's nothing within the nato constitution that says it's automatically right. either a tripwire that sets things off or that it's going to be a full-scale military response. It could simply be a diplomatic note of protest to say, 
Putin, you shouldn't be doing this. So you have a you, yes, uh, yeah. I mean, best case scenario in a sense, but you have a you have a, a an early twentieth century style war of attrition unfolding on European soil, and one of the reasons, and this is quite depressing, one of the reasons why these voices are now converging on the same space is probably because they are now contemplating the possibility of a Russian victory. And, and what that would mean either militarily or diplomatically is not something many of us have seen in our lifetime. Um, I, I think to a certain degree, I'm not sure what the odds of a Russian victory would be. I think if you're going to take the analogy of the First World War, it took the um, Entente powers, France and Britain especially, several years to grind down the German army to a point where yeah, they but, could win but you're and forgetting, to learn the you're, I mean, it's my fault because I drew the parallel, but you're forgetting, we're both forgetting Trump, aren't we? Trump's pretty clear. As Steve Bannon told Robert Peston this week that they wouldn't send another dollar to uh, another penny to Kiev's war effort. Republicans yeah. are blocking President Biden's military aid packages left, right and centre. So, you know, the idea of, of Trump going into the White House and doing whatever Putin tells him to do is is probably motivating some of this conversation uh, I, I would have thought i think it's the realization that perhaps nato isn't as strong as it might be in mm. the event of a, a trump victory and that europe needs to take do more to take on it and to defend its own security um so yeah i, I think there's a degree to that um <laughs> but what, what what we're really starting to see here i think is the, the culmination of what the armed forces have said for many many years that Conditions within the armed forces aren't great in terms of no. accommodation, in terms of capacity, in terms of defence procurement and the problems that exist with that. And so we're seeing, I think, the culmination of this. And now it's starting to get attention because there's something to be focused on in terms of events around the world and not just Russia, Ukraine, but what's happening uh, in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, um, well, I, I, I mean, you can say that again. I, and I, I think the historian, was it Francis Fukuyama who said that history had ended because and by that he meant there won't be any more wars it just we'd reached a sort of um a, a, a position of of peace and that that clearly uh, that ship has sailed obviously but the sort of attitude of western particularly britain perhaps in the last 20 years has been or oh, we don't really need to worry about all that kind of stuff it's not as if there's ever going to be another world war is that I tell you what would be quite useful given the conversation that we've been having? Imagine if we had some sort of European army, wouldn't that be a good thing? So that all of the allies in Europe would be united against a foe like Russia and they could operate without necessarily being beholden to a changing of the guard at the White House. If European allies, I mean, obviously a trading bloc would be a um, a wonderful thing to be part of, but if there was some sort of military force that, that managed to shrug off. Uh, American patronage and therefore address these issues independently of, of America where the next president might well be a, a, a Vladimir Putin lapdog. That would be great, wouldn't it? Do you know, of all the nonsense that Brexit introduced into public discourse, the European army was one of the things I struggled most to understand. I mean, Farage was always belching on about it and as if it was some terrible thing. I presume it's some sort of commando comic post-war hangover, is it? Is, is it? Well, we can't be in the same army as the people we once fought against, which demonstrates such an incredible ignorance of history. Uh, I mean, genuinely incredible ignorance of history to think that because you fought a war against a country 50 years ago, you couldn't possibly be on the same side in the next war. Um, we were on Iraq's side in the Iran-Iraq war. <laughs> and then when they invaded Kuwait, we went and dropped bombs all over them. And these, these ideas are, well, we're talking about Farage. Of course, there's an absolute ignorance about almost anything complicated. But, but my view was always that the armies you're supposed to be worried about are generally not the ones you're in. So they say, oh, we've got to leave the European Union. There's going to be a European army. No one ever stopped to tell me why that would be a bad thing. Why would that be a bad thing? something to do with foreigners probably that's where all brexit breaks down isn't it it's something to do with foreigners james yeah oh okay right well done everybody khalid's in slough khalid what would you like to say hi james hello uh, i wanted to put an idea out there that perhaps this might be uh, a signal that there is negotiations going on underneath the surface between russia and nato mm. and this is really a saber rattling exercise of European nations, because um, it feels rather kind of organised, and, and and it clearly 
it's not a coincidence that well unless unless so i I mean you make an excellent point but it is a contrast to the earlier point that cited bystander effect wasn't it is someone broke ranks i forget who sweden introducing conscription whatever it might be and and therefore the conversation has 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 evolved organically as opposed to you suggest and they both hold water it's it's, the idea that it is a little bit more organized than that I mean, I suppose exactly. I mean, that's my point. It might be p- for two purposes. One, it's saber rattling and, mm. in a sense, um, p- putting down some boundaries with the Russians as we kind of hopefully near towards a political solution. Because yeah. I just I question whether we'll ever get anywhere with a military solution in Ukraine. And then the second point might be it might be a way to re-engage the United States and remind them of, of the horrors of war and the requirements of conscription because, obviously, the United States have their own very troubled history around conscription in More wars recently. that they fought far away yes. exactly and that that's a big part of the american psyche isn't it it's, it's it's very much something that trump appeals to the idea that that these wars are none of our business why are we bringing our boys back in body bags we should just leave these people to to slug it out among themselves so i mean it is the prospect of um and kim Derrick has made this point downing street national security advisor ex downing street national security advisor a a, a victory in ukraine which would probably involve trump essentially um abandoning eastern ukraine to to putin um wouldn't necessarily mean tanks rolling immediately into neighboring nato countries but it might start the systemic systematic destabilization of places like latvia and estonia with with russian large russian populations minority but still quite big and and so if there are talks underway this is just a sort of tightening of a screw one particular screw to say actually you know we're contemplating military engagement we are thinking about it we are talking about it now in the west in a way that we haven't done for a generation and that sends a message to russia that's what you're saying i think that is my point i suppose and the fact is the russians are probably waiting for this election cycle to play out of course they are as I'm sure you've mentioned, there's hundreds of elections going on over the world this year, mm. um, obviously not in Russia. And so clearly um, they're waiting to see where, <laughs> where people sit. And in the United States, and the challenge with Trump is that he can make anything look like a success, right? So, you know, a, a weak stance to North Korea is suddenly a deal with I know, suddenly a, a sign Korea. of his excellent diplomacy. I, I mean, I'd like that. I also like that. <laughs> just that little throwaway comment, if you're wondering why I was laughing. We just went, there was a lot of elections all over the world this year. Obviously not in Russia, which is kind of the point, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, 10.47 is the time. 03456060973 is the number. Um, there's a lot going on, isn't there? I'm glad we've talked about this. I certainly didn't make you any promises about achieving full clarity on an issue as complex as this, but I think we've probably managed to convey the the urgency and importance of it. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10 to 11. Um, I I still haven't quite nailed it, have I? The the relationship we should have with Brexit now uh, in in terms of the time we spend together every day. It trends quite regularly. There is an astonishing catalogue of stories bubbling away at the minute which all illustrate the absolute absurdity of becoming the first population in history to vote to impose economic sanctions on itself but we still have the old problem of uh, relying on on a media that is almost entirely that was almost entirely dedicated to telling you to vote for it how how do they properly and honestly report the um the real the reality of the ramifications the times does a decentish job, actually. Uh, it wasn't a leave paper. Murdoch spread himself, spread his titles right across the uh, issue, as he often does. But the Times, obviously, you can rely on the FT and and uh, up to a point, the Guardian. Although they've got an economics editor who was an ardent, ardently, and, and still is an ardent lever. But the but some of the stories in the Times today, I and mean, just two two or three, straight up. Um, uh, painting a, a pretty grim picture. Uh, uh, the 15 hour waits at Dover when the new checks come in. The trade deal with Canada has been suspended because, guess what? Trading with a country of 60 million people is not as attractive to Canada as doing a deal with a country, with a, with a territory or a market of 500 million odd. Um, and, and quite a few others. I shall do a roundup. I'm thinking, do you think there might be a market for a Brexit podcast now? A weekly sort of half an hour of catching up on what is actually going on as a sort of antidote to the propaganda-driven 
news media. I don't know. I think I, probably someone's already doing it, are they? But if they're not, I, I might. I'm constantly making rods for my own back. You know what will happen? It'll get commissioned, and then this time next month I'll be going, oh, blooming heck. Why did I put my hand up for that? But I, I think it's, it's public service. I think perhaps looking at the news some days now, you sort of think, where can I go? Where's a one-stop shop for all the true ramifications of, uh, of not being in the European Union? I don't know. Anyway, put that on your to-do list. I'm thinking about it. Back to the army and the possibility of World War Three, which I, I just still sounds a bit crackers, doesn't it? But probably less so than it did 53 minutes ago. Harry's in Bristol. Harry, what would you like to say? Yeah, um, thanks for taking my call, first You're of all. You're very welcome. Um, uh, just wondering if we're taking more notice of it and just listening to it a bit more, is there so that we don't know that's happening? Well, obviously there is so that we don't know that's happening in the background. But are they saying it just now to say, well, if it does happen in the future, they can't turn around and say, well, we didn't pre-war Don't blame me. Don't blame me. I bloody told you this was going to happen. It, exactly. You, you get my idea, you know. It's just, that thought just keeps pinging in the back of my head and I can't seem to shift it. I just... Am I the only one thinking it? I or? think you might be. Well, not now because you've said it, so other people will be thinking it. But I don't. I don't know that. I don't. I don't know how much water it holds. I, I think there's too many different voices coming forward for it to be a sort of exercise in um, in preemptive self exoneration. I, th I think that the plan is to make governments because the noise is coming from the military. The plan is to make the politicians take some of these issues more seriously than they currently are. Well, they're, 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 let's be honest, they're never going to do that. They're a bunch of over, overpaid monkeys, and that's my personal opinion. Um, to which you are, of course, entitled. Ex-military by any chance, Harry? How, how does it come across? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think you the know, phrase I, lions I, led by no, donkeys. I've done two somewhere. tours of Afghanistan, and Crikey. you know, I was getting paid, what, £35 a day when yes. I first joined up. And it was just like, well, hang on a minute, I get... I'm, get this much and they're getting that much and it's like, well, they spent, I, I don't know if you saw the story they spent a million quid on severance packages for politicians in Liz Truss's 10 minute long government so I think that makes your point pretty powerfully what's happened to the army since you left it I mean wh wh where is it now in, in, in the context of being ready and even when you were in it as an earlier caller said we can we can go into to foreign territories and do sort of surgical type exercises and then come out again albeit that they often take a little bit longer than originally planned but the idea of a 20 foot 20th century style conflict where two sides are bedded in trying to bite chunks out of each other for, for months and then years it doesn't seem to me the british army would be anything close to ready for a war like that uh um, i completely agree with you to be honest with you uh, i think the morale is down because everyone's worried about cuts at the minute yes. i mean was it a few weeks ago i think they were saying the Marines have got to justify their existence, and that's just stupid, personally. Yes. Um, and and that's why you have that initial thought, oh, it's just generals doing what they always do, which is trying to get more money for the army. But actually, when you add in all the other voices, you realise that this is... Oh, well, there, there is something else going on here, something a little less familiar than the than the usual, almost annual tradition of a general saying, oh, the army's not ready for a war. Can we have some more money, please? This is loads of different military people, senior military people from right across Europe, all all saying more or less exactly the same thing. The only thing they differ on is whether or not it's time to time to unveil the conscription word yet or not. And, and today we have one senior British former soldier doing precisely that in the pages of the Times, a, a former um, deputy supreme allied commander in Europe. As these phrases, these Job titles are great, aren't they? So, Supreme Allied Commander. Did you know? You probably did know this. I think I knew this, but I'd forgotten. Um, James Blunt is on full disclosure. Is it today? Are we releasing it today? I'll play you a bit later. I, 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 I really like James Blunt. I've always really liked James Blunt. Even when it wasn't cool to like James Blunt, I really liked James Blunt. He sort of re rehabilitated his reputation by being amazing on Twitter. But I, I, I don't know if it makes me... Uh, cool or uncool, but I just like his songs. I think he's written some absolutely beautiful, beautiful songs. But And it's a good interview. It's quite a tricky one, actually. I'll tell you more about that later. But he, he led 30,000 troops into Pristina at the end of the war in Kosovo. He wasn't in command, as he pointed out to me, so he was following orders, but he was literally in the front. If he'd turned left, if he'd gone the wrong way, 30,000 troops would have followed him. <laughs> it's like the grand old Duke of York, except there's 30,000 troop men. I, just to use the 
figure of speech from the nursery rhyme. Can you imagine that? 30,000 people behind you. As you go, and you go, which way is it now, boss? Oh, crikey, hang on, let me check, let me check the map. Go right, left, it's a really interesting... Anyway, I digress. Let's squeeze in Lily, who's in Morton in Marsh. Lily, what would you like to say? Hi, James, Hello. thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. <laughs> um, so basically, I just wanted to say, obviously, it's super scary times at the minute, and yes. with them saying, you know, the whole conscription service, I was just saying, when I was in um, secondary school, they made everyone do the CCF between 14 to 18. Yes, same so here, you could actually. I um, so you could either do the army or the uh, RAF at the time. Yes. And I think instead of putting it, obviously we couldn't tell now what's going to happen, but, in, but, you know, getting kids to sort of have these life experiences then. Did you go to private they, school? Did you go to private I, school? I did, yeah, yeah, I did. I think um, it happens quite commonly in private schools, but yeah, not, not in I, not I other was, ones. I, I, was, I was super lucky and it, it built me massively and I got so many experiences from it. But just instead of throwing it on people, it might be quite good to sort of know, encourage. That's actually a really good idea. I, I mean, yeah, I was rubbish. Just, I was red. Right. I did. I was, it no, did don't mean, get me wrong. <laughs> I was so bad. I was the only person eight years not to get a promotion. I was terrible. I think I, I can honestly. beat that. I got told by a wing commander that I was the worst cadet he'd ever had the misfortune to encounter of twenty years. Yeah. School's liaison's officer. Yeah. I was no. in the RAF. I go, we didn't do anything, Lily. Do you know what we did? All the, all, yeah. all was Tuesday afternoons. We just, they just showed us slides of planes. Yeah. And we had to recognise oh, yeah. them. Aircraft recognition. What use is that to yeah. anybody? I'm not going to defeat Vladimir yeah. Putin by being able to go, oh, look, that's a chipmunk. <laughs> no, I know. But the thing was, is that obviously everyone, I completely agree. It wasn't like, obviously... No, but it sows a seed. It sows yeah. a seed, doesn't it? It, it puts it you in. A, it puts you in a place where if if you go, I've got to go. It's time for the news. But that's actually, that's actually a very sensible suggestion. I, I, although you know, as an old bloke, it's all very well being in favour of ideas that don't affect you and do affect young people. But one afternoon a week, CCF. Most private schools do it, I think, or, or certainly an awful lot of private schools do. Um, and and it would just sort of create a different mindset among younger generations about the military because I presume that much older people than me grew up with a completely different attitude. It may even, to be charitable, it may explain why people like Farage were able to give give so many people the willies when they talked about a European army. Maybe there is a different psychological relationship with the notion of the military for older people because of proximity to war. And younger people could have theirs enhanced by what Lily suggests. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 11 is the time, and you're listening to... Well, you know, you should know, I have to keep telling you. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I never should have mentioned that Brexit podcast, should I? You've gone mad for it. It would, in fact, as uh, as No Hostages points out, it would be a sort of equivalent to my tweets that always begin with O. I don't know if you follow me on Twitter. At Mr. James O'B is my handle. Is that the correct term? Do we call it a handle? Is my handle on Twitter is at Mr. James O'B? Um, I, I know it's not called Twitter anymore. It will always be Twitter to me. Uh, and I put O. Oh, so I, sh- I, I tweet a story, which is essentially yet more evidence of Project Fear becoming Project Fact. And I just put O oh on it. And th- there's been quite a few recently. Um, but I, and there's a lot more coming as well. But I must stop doing this at the top of the hour. I must stop doing little sort of asides and uh, and, and uh, diversions and digressions at the top of the hour because you, you want to know what we're talking about, right, this hour. You want to know what to ring in in if, if you're minded to ring in. But don't let me go home today without giving you a little flavour of what my new Brexit podcast might sound like by bringing you up to date with all of the Brexit-related news that probably won't be shared with you by people that encouraged you to slap yourself in the face with a wet fish in 2016. Five minutes after 11 is the time. I, I think this subject is absolutely fascinating. Um, the Victims commis- con- Commissioner and the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, two incredible women, Baroness Newlove and Nicole Jacobs, have turned their attention to um, antisocial behaviour, persistent antisocial behaviour, and they want it to be taken more seriously. They say that it is still considered to be a low-level problem. Police and local authorities do not take it seriously. They want amendments to the Victims Bill that would mean residents suffering persistent antisocial behaviour would have the same sort of support that victims of crime get. Uh, And that would run right up to counselling. 
I want to know, I want your help today in making everybody listening understand why this is not a low level problem, why this is such a serious subject. To be, and, and I think the word victim is actually quite helpful in this case, to be the victim, to be a victim of persistent antisocial behavior in your home. So it is, it is happening in your home. I'm not talking about uh, street crime. We, we talked about that quite a lot yesterday. It's about, it's about having your peace of mind stolen by people who live near you or people who congregate near where you live. I, I, I don't know why this one gets me so much because I've never suffered from it. I've never endured it. But I think we all have a little flavour of it, don't we? If there's a car parked outside your house at 2 o'clock in the morning and the music is really, really loud, it's a weird sense of violation because you're in your home and yet someone is polluting your existence. Someone is, someone is stealing your, your peace. That's a good phrase. I like that phrase. They're stealing your peace of mind. And it could be your neighbours or, or it could be that you have unfortunately ended up living somewhere where other people congregate. But the culture within the police, according to Baroness Newlove, is to treat it not as a criminal activity, but as a neighbourly dispute or misdemeanour. And that means they don't investigate, even if the criminal threshold has been met. And she describes it as arising from an institutional view that all antisocial behaviour is low level and low harm. So I just want you to tell me your story on this one. I want you to tell me the story of antisocial behavior in your home in your life that will help other people understand that it is categorically not a low level issue i have some breaking news for you if, if and football fans in particular will be interested to learn that jürgen klopp the manager of liverpool has announced he'll be stepping down at the end of the season that's a very big story in football circles perhaps not quite as big as phil brown going to Kidderminster Harriers earlier this month, but um, I, I, I suppose it depends upon your perspective, but Jürgen Klopp is stepping down as Liverpool manager at the end of the year. I, I, I kind of, I want your help in conveying the psychological impact of antisocial behaviour. Often when we talk about the internet and bullying of children, we talk about the difference between their generation and mine in that most people could close the door on their problems at the end of the day. You would get home from school, you could close the door. I Less so for people like me who went to boarding school, but you, you take my point. You, you, you throw your satchel under the, under the table in the hall uh, and, and turn the telly on, make yourself some toast and sit down in front of Blue Peter, and, and you were temporarily safe from the things that were plaguing your existence at school, for example, or at work. You, 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 you have that sense. What's the word? There's probably a German word for it, for, for a particular sense of calm that comes from being at home. It's, it's, it's enhanced. You can be peaceful on a bus. You can be peaceful in a park. But there's something cocoonish about being at home and feeling safe, feeling calm, feeling peaceful. And what antisocial behavior does is take that away from you. It, it takes it away. Is it hugger? Is that, the, is that what I thought? Is that the Danish word sort of... Is that specific to being at home? It's a Danish or Norwegian word that describes a cozy, contented mood evoked by comfort and conviviality. I think it's more primal than that. So that makes me think of comfy pillows as opposed to being at home as the simple act of sealing yourself off from the outside world and being unreachable, untouchable by problems that may be plaguing you when you're outside. Or even if you haven't got any problems at the moment in your life, the fact that you're at home, sanctuary is the word I was looking for. Well played. Sanctuary. Um, you have a sense of sanctuary. That's more than hugger. And, and it is perhaps unique to being at home. And what antisocial behavior can do is, is just break that. And until it happens, you probably didn't know how valuable it was to have in the first place. So it could be young people congregating on the street outside. You could actually have been specifically targeted as opposed to 
uh, just having to deal with with random noise. I I suspect that noise and neighbours have a psychological impact upon people that Baroness Newlove is a hundred percent correct about. It, it is it is almost a form of torture. If they use it as a form of to keep not being able to sleep at night is a form of torture. Sleep deprivation is a form of torture. And yet if the victims commissioner is correct and we have no reason to doubt her, then the police are not taking it seriously. One in ten so four one in four adults has suffered from antisocial behaviour that made them feel unsafe in their local behaviour, in their local area, forgive me. And of those, one in ten said it had been so persistent that they had been forced to move home. So you'd go straight to the front of the queue. What was it that was so awful about your last place that made you actually move? You didn't want to move except to escape the antisocial behaviour. You were enjoying. You liked your home. But somebody or some people rendered it intolerable. I want to get to the heart of the psychological impact of it, but also the detail of what it was that you went through. The numbers you need, as always on this programme, are 0345 606 There is a German word, apparently, although I'm going to mispronounce it horribly. Well, actually, I better check that's not rude. Oh, no, more than one person has sent it in, so you're not encouraging me to say Rudy's. I'd have to check that. I don't want to say the German word for something filthy by accident, but there is a German word, and it is Gemut. Lichkeit, Gemütlichkeit, or something, worse to that effect. That's what I want. Um, and I also want to know, on a broader issue, where, where it's coming from. Why is this problem so much bigger than it used to be? I, 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 I'm not an old bloke who likes to wang on about how things were better in the good old days. But there is a sense... I, do you know where I get it? Sheila Fogarty and I have got this in common. The people on public transport who don't have headphones on, but a that are watching stuff or listening to stuff or, or having, a t having a conversation on speaker instead of quietly. It just speaks of a, of a psychological shift in parts of the population to a place where you are supremely unaware. I'd, I'd like to think that if someone took a moment to explain to you how obnoxious that is, you'd probably realise. But you've somehow ended up in a space where you're supremely unaware of how... Your conduct is impacting on other people. I, I, I marvel at it sometimes, particularly on the bus, more than the tube. So you don't really get the signal on the tube. But I catch the bus every day. And more often than not, there'll be someone either watching a program, like watching a film, or conducting a conversation, not so much listening to music, that, that, that slightly odder behaviour, without having headphones on. And you sort of think, you're not in a bubble. People seem to think that they're living in... In, in a state of detachment from the rest of society. And I think that perhaps explains some elements of antisocial behaviour, but that's not to excuse it or indeed to ignore the fact that some people, some people are, are, are just really rude. They almost revel in their rudeness. So what's it like to have your home life completely disrupted by antisocial behaviour? And for the rest of us, lucky enough not to have lived through this or be living through this, what, what is it that has changed? Most recently, 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 11, victims of persistent antisocial behaviour should have a legal right to counselling, just like victims of violent crime. Two government commissioners have said. Why? Why do you know that that is a good idea? And how, how badly has your life been affected by, in your home, your life in your home, by, by antisocial behaviour? Uh, Joanne is in Fulham. Joanne, what can you tell us? Hello, yes, uh, thanks for taking my call. Good You're morning. You're very welcome. Hello. Yes, I had a very severe case, actually. I sold my property in the end to move from an antisocial issue. So that was the, that was that you'd still be there now if yeah. it wasn't for the neighbours? Yes, Good indeed, Lord. absolutely, yes. Yeah, It was that tragic. Yes. <laughs> I had a very severe case. I tried to get the police involved. The council were involved. The police kept referring it back to the council, saying it's a council issue. They must deal with it. Right. We tried to have some mediation. Uh, that didn't go forward because the lady kept pulling out and said she didn't want to do it anymore. Right. Um, it was basically a family living above me that were quite, um, I would say, they were dealing drugs. I had no proof of this. Okay. They had people coming and going all night on the doorsteps. They were um, always someone there. They were actually dropping things on the floor at four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, just to traumatize me, keep me awake. I didn't sleep 
for three years I was there, I didn't sleep at all. That's that's uh, that's my, murder, isn't it? Because yeah, you, yeah, you it was, it was hell. Because you hell. you, you nod off. You you nod off. Yeah. You, 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 and they'll do it on purpose to wake me up. Well, I, I mean, yeah. you, you, you're clearly certain of that to the to the point where yeah, you move. Sure. What would if they were here? What would they say? I mean, they might have felt that they, that they had a grievance against you. I don't know. Yeah, and that's what uh, I, I reflect on. I think, you know, did I do something wrong? I'll yeah. put it in perspective. I'm a single, full-time working mother. I had a daughter of five years old at the time. Yes. I used to come home at the end of my day at 7 o'clock in the evening with my daughter from school and from work, exhausted. I would go straight to sleep, put yeah. her in bath, wake up early, leave again. No one would know I was there. Right. So I, I had a real clear mission of my life, yeah. just working, getting through the working week with my daughter. Um, it... I looked at it, they, they looked at it, I guess, that I was a different class to them. I shouldn't be in the same building as them because they were t- um, council tenants. Right. But I was a private owner in the same building. So some envy there so then, was, probably. A lot of envy, I would guess, I say, that's what I believe. But also uh, their upbringing, you know, they didn't, I think they were from a different background as well and had moved around a lot, weren't really accepted into society, but their behavior wasn't accepted in society either. You know, the behaviour wasn't right when we were how, living in a... How did it start? Was, was, it, was it just noise? Was it just... Because yeah, the, I, I think actually, that unless it's yes. happened to you, it's impossible to understand what it's like, isn't it, to have people above you usually rather than yeah, below you. This is the thing. It started off with the noise, and I gently um, uh, mentioned that to yes. them. I just said, oh, hi, you know, uh, there's a little bit... Would you care to be careful on the floor? Because yeah, yeah. it's really waking up in the night, and I'm sorry to... To mention it, and they're like, "Oh yeah, sure, of course, we'll be fine, no problem." Okay. It persisted, persisted, but then also it got so bad it became violent. Uh, two men kicking my door down in the middle of the night, and my daughter seeing it, a five years old, scared stiff, wetting the bed that night because she was traumatized. And it, it was so we we actually lived with trauma after that when we moved on. You sound, you I, t- I mean, I don't know you, Joanne, but you sound as if you're still tra- a bit traumatized by it. Oh, you, you sound as if your your heart's yeah. going ten to the dozen, even as you tell the story. Well, you're absolutely right because actually it's bringing up all the bad memories. I thought it might. Be. I used to be hounded, you know, leaving my property at seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning, hounded with a woman shouting out the window at me, Good abuse. Ah, if I'd mow my garden. My yeah. grass on, on the weekend, she'll be shutting out the window at me. It was just an anger. And, uh, and, it, and it know, reached I, the point where you thought, I've got to get out of here. Yeah, it would become violent. And actually, it came to the point where I was very scared of what my reaction will be now to defend myself and my daughter being lone female in a house. So to me, I was scared about how, how far to the breaking point where they push me, where I'm going to react in such a bad way, I'm going to be imprisoned. With my daughter taken away, it got that bad. My father and my family said, look, you know, get out of there. At all costs, even if you lose on the property, just get out. No, and I mean, I for your, right. it, sounds, it sounds like it. I, I, well, I'm glad you did, but goodness me, it does sound as if you're still haunted by it. And I can completely understand why. That sleep is probably the biggest thing that can be taken from you. Uh, God knows insomnia is a, is a nightmare itself, but when it's not insomnia, it's actually disruption. It's deliberate disruption even. Then, I, I did, I've just, listening to Joanne Audley, I've just been reminded, I did have a tiny experience of it many, many moons ago. Um, uh, I shared a flat with a guy who was getting quite obsessive about the noise coming from downstairs, and they were obsessed with him. I think he'd taken out the carpets and put in um, like a Hessian flooring, and they were furious. So they could obviously hear more movement above than they could before. And they'd call the noise abatement on, on each other. It was during my days as a gossip columnist, so I was never in. But they would call the noise abatement on each other. And one time they went to see the people downstairs, and they genuinely had put their speakers on top of their wardrobe, facing up at the ceiling above, so that, the, so that we would be kept awake by the noise. And do you know what? I don't think I've ever clocked this. I think they had LBC on. Now I come to think of it, I, I wasn't that familiar with LBC growing up because I didn't grow up in London and we weren't a national station then. But I think that they were torturing us with LBC. There's an irony there somewhere, isn't there? Joanne, I'm happy that you are in a better place, both physically, geographically and indeed metaphorically. Kerr is in Armadale in Scotland. Kerr, what, what would you like to say? OK, let me set the picture for you, James. Go on. Imagine you do a 14-hour shift, right? That's quite hard for me to imagine, Kurt. You appreciate that, I hope. I I clock off at lunchtime, but I'll do my I'll do my best to conjure it up in my mind. (laughs) (laughs) Right, okay. See if you can conjure this up, right? So you get in, you get in about eleven ish, right? You lie down, you're like, right, I'm about to go to sleep, and then and then all you hear is do 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 do, like your neighbours are 
you know, having a discotheque. Yes. Right? Just just imagine that, that right? Base, isn't and, it? and it doesn't go on until about one in the morning. It doesn't go on until about two. It goes on until about five or six in the morning. Oh. Right? And then, then, because they're so whacked out their gourd, the dog starts barking. And it barks for about two hours. And then you're like, well, I can't have my sleep. Eight o'clock, got to go back to work. That's it. It's over. Imagine that one, James. I, I, I am imagining that, and I'm feeling your pain. Are they next door, upstairs, downstairs? What's, what's... No, no, next door, next door. And, it, and it's a terrace. It's a, it's a connected house. Well, um, yeah, basically, yeah. detached And have you ever spoken no, no, to it? No, no, semi-detached. It's like, um, it's like flat. But so, so the wall, it's coming through your wall is the point. Yeah, 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 basically. Have you ever tried on. to talk to them? No, they're they're they're, they're quite big um, gets if I'm being honest. So they're intimidating. And I'm just a skinny wee fella. So they're physically intimidating people living. Oh a, yeah, a, a, oh yeah. I mean, we're talking proper skinhead. A nocturnal life. Is there anything you can do? Do you have? Because this is the point that the victims commissioner is making. She's talking about you, really, Kurt. Is that? Yeah. If, if, there's no one you can turn to, and even if you did, well, call... no, because I, I went to my counsellor. Yeah. Right, and they're normally quite good. Right. Right, but they said, well, all we can really do is send a letter. It's bizarre, isn't it? I wonder what else they could do. Honestly. They're coming at it from your perspective, as in you should get more help, but perhaps counselling. I think the last caller really proved that counselling would be very welcome in some of these cases. But in terms of making the problem stop, it's hard to know what could actually work. Well, exactly. You get evicted. Exactly. Only eviction would work, really, ultimately, because people are not going yeah, to... Yeah, yeah, but turn. considering... Cause I just want to say, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that, because although it is annoying, we've got to remember, like, this is bare basic council accommodation. You mm. evict them and they'll have nowhere else to go. You're a nice man. So, I mean, You're a nice man. So, so, nice so it them, is a tricky one. What sort of toll is it taking on you? Is it every night? Is it every night? Never, well, mainly every night. Well, here's the thing. Like I say, I'm a support worker. I do 14-hour shifts, yeah. right? I've caught myself falling asleep at work. That's not good. And if I get caught, that that's it done. Really? Yeah. Oh man, you go. I don't know what to say. Just take care of yourself, Carl. Seriously. It's, Cheers, it's, mate. And it is that bass. It's that thumping bass because you can't even earplugs don't work, do they? I'm putting your own oh, music God, on. You or... can feel it. it's like a vibration. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. I might. I might. Ugh. Right. Well, there it is. I mean, that that that, that sense there, that that that, that torture, as it, as it were, with the uh, 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 then the unpredictability of it, and then you relax. So it's only ever had, most people listening to this have had an experience of it that was just for one night, like on holiday or something like that, and then you relax. You say, "Oh, it stopped," and then it starts again. And oh man, a live car! I do feel for you. I really do. Twenty-seven after eleven is the time. Molly's in Westminster. Molly, what would you like to say? Oh hi, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a real lo- ongoing, but it should end at some point. Go on. The landlord next door was defrauded on his rental, and um, somebody's taken it over. And every two weeks, there's a new group of sex workers that move in. It's a muse. It's really quiet. Um, I've had to negotiate with various pimps for no heels, no stripper heels. I mean, it's been an absolute nightmare. So they're in the same building as you, are they? Next door. I'm in a muse house. Oh, okay. So literally okay. the house next door. Paper, so they, well, what's the problem know, with the heels like, then? Just the noise? It's like I thought it was DIY initially. Right, and okay. knocked on the door and... The guy that was looking after them just said, oh, it's all right, love. You just get them to take their heels off. And since then, every two weeks, three weeks, groups change. I get men knocking on my door at night. At Christmas, there was a queue, six men waiting to go in. Good Lord. Um, recently, the webcam work has got loud, so I hear that right. as well. It is, I can only say it's a kind of low-level stress not sort of moments of anger at all it's just a low level stress that uh, you've got you. nowhere to go yeah. nowhere to go Initially, that's the I was point now nah, that's it. the point because you go home to escape from low level stress and yet it <laughs> it's there yeah. that's the that's it was the... funny initially it was funny i mean you know you could imagine you've got and a also... brothel next door <laughs> Yes, I can see and why also, that was funny originally. <laughs> and also, I'm torn between worrying about trafficked 
girls. Yeah, I called the union of prostitutes just to check that I, I should be worried. Shouldn't police don't even make welfare calls on them? There was one that that was it was re- there was really a lot of noise one mm, night, and yeah. I I worried. Yeah. Um, but the worst of it is that literally I can't use one side of my house. It's you know, and the night and and it's night activity. And we work in the day, right. and it's so it it's just ongoing. It's a foreign landlord who invested, um, has no uh, investment in the community at all. Doesn't right. really care. Sure. I mean, obviously, he's getting ripped off because they're not paying rent. I know that. So, who can um, you turn to? What did the police? No say? one. No one at all. No one. Police brothels are legal. Right. But, so, but in terms of the criminal, I mean, what case can I bring? I mean, I'm not the defrauded. No, I, don't, I know. So there's, there's nothing. Um, what, so how does it end then? Are you just hoping that it they ends with eviction at some point? It's an online platform. Not going to say which one. No, please I don't. I don't think they're very. No, they're not. They're not very, very careful. Secure. I would. T- yeah, they're really not. Um, as as, rig- as 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 rigorous as say a local estate agent would be. Every, and it can happen to anyone, by the way. But and um, they're not as rigorous. And it's just, I have to say, there were moments where I just kind of sob. <laughs> no, I can um, believe it because it's the it's the unrelenting nature of it. That's that's what I was keen to communicate. I'm just sorry that so many people are in such a position to do so. That that. Most it's like light at the end of the tunnel territory. There isn't one, you know, or, or if there is, you don't know what it looks like. The business model involves them moving on at some point, but when I don't know, and and that's why Joanne, the first caller, comes back round again when she she actually moved house. It, Molly, sound as if you're a long, long, long way away from that. But imagine the injustice of that being being essentially hounded out of a home that you love because of other people's inability to behave themselves um and and i want to bring that element of of the conversation up as well what what is it I don't, am i sounding like you know that thucydides in about 1500 bc wrote about how the younger generation were awful so there is nothing new about men saying people saying oh aren't the younger generation oh things are much worse than they were in my day so am i turning into that or is there a sense that the awareness of people around you has diminished in recent years i mean the example i gave you was people using their technology on buses but of course the technology didn't exist when we were younger so maybe if it had done it would have i don't know is is there a change in society brought about by an increasing um i'm going to use a great word probably incorrectly atomization a sort of increasing atomization of the population uh, i'm now going to look that word up while thomas watts brings you the headlines james o'brien on lbc James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.36. Um, I, th- this notion of antisocial, it's a very, very big deal, but it, it's... Uh, and I didn't realise Keir Starmer was talking about it today. I don't know whether there's a link between the two, but you just heard Thomas mention it in his in his news bulletin. I, I mean, how does the politics of it work? I, I, it is another example of Starmer essentially uh, uh, demonstrating a genuine desire to help people who are going through things that that government or, or, or the state or authority should be helping with. I think Kerr, the, the caller from Scotland, who just described that sense of complete impotence, um, uh, possibly articulated it best, although Joanna, having to move house, uh, d- described it in the most arresting of terms. Well, what could a politician actually do? Well, if a former DPP can't help, then I, then I wonder who can. So we'll take some more calls on that. But I also I do want to give you a quick update. Um, thanks to a chap on, on Twitter, actually, called Edwin Haywood, the author of Slaying Brexit Unicorns. I've got a rather tidy little digest of everything that's happened in 24 hours regarding Brexit. And I tell you, it beggars belief, frankly, unless you listen to this show, in which case you'll barely be surprised. 11.37 is the time. Back to the antisocial behaviour. Paul's in Leeds. Paul, what made you pick up the phone? Hi, James. I love to speak to you. Hi, we had the, basically me and the missus, we lived in a seven floor flat um, quite, it's quite a number of years ago. And yeah. the guy above us, used to live above us, um, unfortunately died. And the flat was empty for probably a good couple of months. Um, we started seeing a, a guy wandering in and out of the lift, sort of chinking sides all the time. And he'd, you'd see him in the morning, you'd see him in the night. And he, yeah. he was obviously going up to that flat. Right. And he was moving, he was basically moving in. And he, so we started doing a lot of shuffling around during the evening because we were both at work during the day. And um, 
sort of just, you know, let them get on with it because they're decorating and all that. So yeah. over the weeks, we started here and um, one night about 11 o'clock, we just started in this doom, 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 like, like a, like Long John Silver walking across the floor. <laughs> That's what it sounded like, you know. Right. On, on, so you mean with a, someone it, with a wooden leg is what you're saying? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Right. We've been hearing this for like a few days, and it was starting to get a bit annoying. Do you so know, we, the problem we, I've got here is partly because yeah. of your accent and partly because of the way you're telling the story. It sounds like you're setting up a punchline, Paul. No, no, there's no punchline. <laughs> no, I, I know, I know there isn't. We to move on. So, you know, <laughs> Go on. I, I am a scouser originally, but I've lived in Leeds for probably half my life. So, anyway. So, um, there's a fella upstairs, sounds like he's got a wooden leg. Yeah, yeah. So, but he hasn't because we've seen him in the lift. Yes. So I, I thought after after a week of this, I thought right, I'll go and approach him. So I did. I went upstairs, finally knocked on his door. He got out, scraggy headed bloke. He was ass drunk, you know what I mean? And I said, "Listen, mate, do us a favour." Said the noise you're making. It's like eleven o'clock at night. Do you mind just you know yeah. turning in a little bit and do it during the day? We're both at work. You're obviously not at work, so I could just tell in the way he was. He said, yeah, it's not me, mate. I said, well, who is it? He said, I think I've got a ghost. <laughs> there is a punchline. You <laughs> <laughs> So I said to him, who's the ghost of a pirate? Because all we can hear is someone clock, clock, clock over the, over the, the yeah. you know, in the living room of the night. Yeah. So he just claimed all the time. He said, it's not me. It's a ghost. I found my paint brushes everywhere. I found <laughs> me, me, me paint pots in the, in the fridge and all kind of stuff. He was coming up with some, like, Garbage. I look if there's any way I can use. Um, so anyway, um, how long did it go on for? It went on for about two or three weeks. So right. we're it's not we're quite. We're not quite in the realms of psychological torture here, are we, Paul? It, yeah, it went on for things before I got into the council. It went on for a lot longer than that because he refused to talk to us in the end. He oh. wouldn't open his door. He was putting rotten fish through our letterbox. Really? Uh, well, he, he, he went off his head. He just so, took against you. How did you get rid of him? Well, we ended up in mediation. Right. Um, in the end, because we found out it was his wife who had moved in. She did actually have a prosthetic leg, but she was wearing, like, <laughs> clogs. It was like, basically, walking across a wall. Why, would he, why would he not tell you that his wife lived? Was, what was he, was he hid, he'd hidden his wife, had he, or something? I, I, I don't know. This I don't know what it is. He was planning on locking it in a cupboard, and I don't All know. Right. So there was someone there with a prosthetic there. leg. It wasn't your imagination. Yeah, yeah. It certainly wasn't yeah, a ghost. It, yeah. Yeah, and he'd, he'd put um, thing your floor down, um, you know, wooden yeah, floor. Yeah. Which you don't put down on an egg floor flat when you've got someone directly below you. You wouldn't have thought. So, so what had, happened in mediation then? So we had mediation with the couple and, and me and me and me, me, Mrs. Emma. And, yeah. Um, yeah. We spoke about maybe them getting them changed to the carpets. You know, yeah. we'd even help along with it if it made, it made our life a bit easier. Yeah. And they both got up and walked out and said... Basically, no. so Jews were staying here, off you go, and we ended up leaving in the end because we just couldn't. It went on for months and months every night, and I mean, it ended up being psychological. Toy. I felt like people were walking through the head every night. It was like, and how did it? How did it end? Nightmare. Well, we moved out in the end. Oh, we, we blimey, ended up sorry. There. So this is sorry. I thought this was a less serious story than some of the others. So it reached a <laughs> point where you just thought, I can't put up with this anymore. Yeah, because because they were not willing to listen, and then kept, like I said, they were putting. Well, they didn't. I tell you what, Paul, they didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> that was going to be my punchline. Nah, <laughs> it's not funny. I mean, I the the, the and, and obviously no offence intended to anybody who is um uh, yeah yeah, uh, yeah. What, what, all of that. But that that so that it's hard to express, isn't it? You just reach that breaking point. You reach that point where you go, no, can't do it. Not having it. Yeah, and, and off you go. It's easier as a tenant, probably. It's easier to move than it is as a as a homeowner. Yeah, I mean, it did help us. Uh, you know, in the end, it probably did work in our favour because we ended up getting out and getting a house instead of after it was Leeds City Council at the time, you know, and, and we, they managed to move that a lot quicker because we sort of got pushed up the lid because we both sort of said, you know, it's we're not just suffering mental abuse, you know, it's, it's everything around it. We know we're struggling with work because we're getting crept up at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the right. morning and I, I, I knocks it. on the door and, you know, well, the rest of it. So, yeah, yeah, it I was, do. No, it is, it's, well, I, I, again, I, don't, I, I mean, I agree that, that counselling would be helpful for people like you and all our callers today, but what the actual... and we'll Probably have a look at what Starmer said in this speech, shouldn't we, and see whether or not he's laid out any actual plans to deal with the with the issue, as it were, as opposed to the to the aftermath, as opposed to the consequences. Um, this one caught my eye, oddly. I mean, it, what a desperately unlucky system of events this is, where we go... Um, I thought we'd cracked it, James. We had two young boys who were never told off because their parents worked such long hours. 
and they wanted their kids to like them. So they would scream and scream and scream from 6.30 in the morning until bedtime. They moved out and we thought our lives would get better. A new couple moved in and they've got a dog. When they're in, you don't hear a peep. But the minute they leave, um, the dog starts howling and barking for all, all day long, up to five hours at a time. Sometimes, uh, this is the line that caught my eye. Sometimes the quiet is almost worse than the barking itself because you are always anticipating it in the quiet times that 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 yeah that's what i was trying to convey earlier that sense of of never actually being able to relax because you're just waiting for it to start again and the minute you let yourself relax it probably will start again it's a killer isn't it kate's in barnet kate what can you tell us yeah thanks for taking my call james um yeah so i mean ours happened about 10 years ago we had a a dream home which i purchased when i had my second child Mm. um and spent a sort of a 12 month lovingly doing up, renovated, um, did some restructuring on it, and then moved in. And we had a a wonderful time for about a year, just under a year. Um, And then we had an unusual situation in that the person living next door to us on one side was um, an elderly couple, an elderly family with a woman, a very old woman, and she had three children who used to come and go and look after her. She passed away. And then the the neighbour on the other side of us bought the home. Right. So I hope you can follow that. So yeah, I can, it's a terrace property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then one one neighbour was the one who purchased the other side, and then he uh, illegally turned it into a HMO, so a house of multiple occupancy. Uh. Uh, yeah, and then filled it with about ten to twelve very young people who were uh, a mixture of drug dealers, students. Um, uh, employed people as well, but all very young. And, so noise. Uh, all very, yeah, noise, music, um, you know, sort of uh, relations, shall we say, put it mildly. Mm. Uh, two, and my children were two and six at the time, That's so we used to play a game. Me. Yeah, we used to play a game with them where we sort of, you know, tell them, right, okay, you know, let's put a bit of bit of a, a, a music on or a CD on in your room mm. as you're going to bed because no one could sleep. Mm, uh, no. It got violent in the end. We went used to go next door and speak to the, the landlord and say, look, you know, they're making a lot of noise. There's lots of people in there. You don't know what it's like. Um, and we tried our best to be uh, as polite about it as possible, but it got violent in the end. He picked up a metal grate at one point to attack my husband oh, dear. Um, and the police had to be called. So, yeah, we had um, many visits from the police. Could um, they do anything? Um, yes, they spoke to them, to be fair. Mm. They spoke to them. They went next door and, and talked to them. But then they retaliated by calling the police on us. Oh, God. <laughs> I know. It was so bizarre. Um, and they came and said, well, they've complained about you. They sent about two squad cars to talk to a family with a two-year-old and a six-year-old, which was very strange, but it was a complete retaliation. Very, very So you, that's it. Your peace of mind's gone. You're, you're just being yeah, stolen from and you. the person, yeah, the, the, the tweet or the uh, text that you just read out was very true. So the, no, the when it was quiet, yeah. you, you didn't really get a chance to enjoy it because you were always waiting for the noise to start. There was one point where he was, he decided to kick a ball, a football against the wall or a tennis ball. I'm not quite sure which one it was, but... And he'd do it continuously. Yes. Like, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, for, you know. Oh, I'll drive you potty. About an hour. So you yeah, moved. I don't know, yeah, we, we, two years, and we put up with it. And then um, just thought, we can't take it anymore. We can't take it anymore. So we lost, well, luckily for me, I had the means to keep it on as a rental property. So it's now a rental property. Right. And we moved, yeah, and found comfort in, in Barnet. And, were, yeah, we're surrounded by elderly people. <laughs> Barnet's a very aged area. <laughs> I don't um, want to upset the good burgers of Barnet. I'm sure it's as... Uh, but I hear you. You're just not... You don't, yeah. Your nightmare would be to see a bunch of people in their early 20s moving in next door. And loads and loads of young people, perfectly wonderful neighbours, but not the ones that you ended up living next door to. Thank you, Kate. Um, James in Hounslow points out that sometimes people who are hard of hearing will be using their loudspeakers on phones. And um, uh, I absolutely don't want to add to your burdens, James. So we, we, we must recognise that for some people that is the only mode um, of, of communication that works, whether you're on public transport or not. But I, but I, I certainly... Um, wasn't including you in my critique of people who are watching the football highlights on the bus with the volume on full and no headphones on. Uh, 11.47 is the time and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. 11.51 is the time. I, I think um might mix things up a little bit here. Uh, c- can, we, can we activate the sting, please, Keith? Sneak here, sneak here. Sneak here. So, I, I don't know if you remember Esther McVeigh. If, you, if you'd forgotten about her, I can only apologise for bringing her back into your consciousness. So she, She's written an article for the Daily Mail today, uh, which accompanies a headline that says, Minister for Common Sense, Labour wokery would divide Britain. And uh, McVeigh's piece has the headline, So does Starmer want a society of feuding factions? And what I love about this smear care story is... The absolute pant-wetting stupidity of it. So Keir Starmer gave a speech, uh, was it last week or yeah, last week or early this week, when he finally got around to addressing the ludicrous attempts to turn everything into a culture war by the Tories, focusing particularly on the National Trust and, uh, and the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. And he essentially said, oh, just give over and stop it, will you? It's pathetic, which is obviously true. So Esther McVeigh has somehow managed to write an article which accuses him of waging culture wars. A a man who's only really said one thing on the subject, which was, stop being so silly. And her proof that he is waging a culture war is this. This is a man who who solemnly took the knee in support of the Black Lives Matter organisation in 2020. Estimate they calls it divisive, which is actually true. It divides racists from non-racists. So I give her that. It is quite divisive because racists hate it and non-anti-racists do it. So that proves that he's a culture warrior somehow, Um, which makes the entire Premier League and every footballer in the world a culture warrior, give or take one or two, of course. And he also apparently finds it notoriously difficult to define what a woman is. But why do people keep asking him? Answer, well, actually, whether Esther McVeigh is bright enough to understand this or not, I do not know. But 30p Lee has provided a very helpful explanation of what's actually going on here. The big thing in, in 2019, there was three things that won us the election. It was nothing to do with me. Uh, it, was, it was Brexit, it was Boris, it was Corbyn. Mm. And it was as simple as that. Those three things together was a great campaign. Mm. Great ingredients. Um, mm. At the next election, we haven't got those three things. So mm. we're going to have to yeah. think of something else. It'll probably be a, cult, a mixture of culture wars and trans debate. <laughs> so there is the recently resigned deputy chairman of the Conservative Party who really wants his job back and really regrets not voting for the bill that he resigned in order to vote against but didn't vote against because when he went into the lobby some nasty people started giggling, sniggling at him. Um, he is literally, and he got made deputy chairman after that, so he has literally laid out the desperation that the Tory party has to to turn everything into culture war, to fight an entire election on culture wars. Keir Starmer turns around and says, stop being so silly. And Esther McVeigh writes an article for the Daily Mail about how Keir Starmer is obsessed with waging culture wars. I, I, look, Smear Keir is, is up and running now. But every day, every, I mean, are we going to get a better one than that? Here it is. Starmer's real problem is that not only is he a card-carrying culture warrior, so it's a bit like, I don't know if you've ever, I'm trying to think of an analogy here, where one person is screaming furiously at the other person, and the other person is just sort of looking at them a bit like this, a bit sort of, all right, Karen, what's that, what... So you need that. You've got that. So we're having a really big fight, aren't we? You and, and you just sort of go. You're a bit weird, aren't you? Calm down. What are you getting so worked up about? You look at you, you big old culture warrior. So there you go. And she is apparently now known as the Minister for Common Sense. And what do you think that is, if not a desperate attempt to in, 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 inject cultural nonsense into just about every corner of political discourse? So that is this week's probably, and there's only an hour left together, so there may be a late contender. That's probably the best example this week of... Oh, we got a short one. Where did that come from? Did you do that? Well done, Keith. That's nice. See what happens if we all pull together. Team OB. It's finally come. It's fine. Yay! Uh, Peter's in Stoke-on-Trent. Last word on the antisocial behaviour. You wouldn't want to live next door to Estimate Vey, would you, Peter, come to think of it? But we digress. What, 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 what prompted you to pick up the phone? Uh, yeah, so ASB. So I live in a uh, quiet cul-de-sac. I've uh, been here for about 18 years. So um, we're in a kind of a semi-rural area. So you think it's... It's really quiet and so on. But, That's uh, your dog. Oh, this is already gone a bit awkward. That's your dog, right? 
Ah, yes, it is. And, and now you're about you to complain the, about... There's, there's, actually, there's actually two police cars outside, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Crikey. But anyway... This is all very live. Long, Carry on. It, it's very live, absolutely. So long story short, yes. we have somebody, um, a resident in our community that is a... Or a family, shall we say, that are involved in, shall we say, drug dealing. Okay? Right. And the, the simple fact is, is that it's all the stuff that comes with that. So we have um, taxis at all hours, people coming up on bikes, um... People could be in beeping their horns in their own cars and things. People wandering around in the street. They've obviously been taking stuff. And as we live in the cul-de-sac and as you're sort of walking up and down, you see these people quite regularly. And, it, and it's quite disturbing because some of them are off their faces. No, it's horrible. It's it, horrible. It, it's, it's, really, it's really quite scary. So, yes. what When did they move in? It? When did they move in? Um, well, they moved in actually about 2008. So they've actually been here a long time. But the interesting thing about it was, is that it, was only, it only became apparent to the majority of the community just after lockdown. Okay, what and, was going and, and essentially what happened? What, what, essentially, what happened is, is that the family concerned um, had the property bought for them by their parents. The parents ran a successful um, local building company. Uh, um, the individual concerned was a director of that company, yeah. but he got himself into drugs. His father eventually sacked him, and his only way of making money is essentially getting involved with drugs. And okay, so, so the sector. situation has escalated over the years. Why are the police there Absolutely. now? Um, because they said regular patrols to try and deal with it. And that's the next point I've come on to, because yeah. I, once I became aware of it two years ago, I thought, I'm not accepting this. You know, we live in a quiet community. These things shouldn't be happening. And I want to do something about it. So I started by writing to the local MP, um, the local councillors, and eventually got in touch with the police. And ultimately, we have some some level of dialogue with the, with the local chief inspector, the local commander mm. for our borough. And to be fair to him, he's been very, very good and stuff. But the the fundamental problem is it's very, very difficult for the police to actually do anything about it. Yeah, because that's the point, they, isn't it? Yeah, this is the this is the problem. Is that you know you, you take this individual for court for misdemeanours, they just fine him, let him off, and he comes back and carries on doing what he's doing. We've even had we've even had situations with some partial closures on the property as well, which is basically restricting the people that actually go there, the people that live there, and so on. But here's the worst part about it: they have children that live in that property. Right. So you've got all these activities going on. There's, there's sometimes fighting. There's all these bad people turning up and so on. But it's ultimately mm. disrupting the community. And what should be a nice, peaceful area is, is, is problematic. And that's a sad part. How much damage has it done to your peace of mind? It's not, it's not quite the same as having a sort of thumping bass line or, or a wooden leg coming through the floors well, or the walls. Yes, yeah, so this is the previous call, yeah. the previous call is about that. But what you have is, is that as soon as you go into the street, you don't know what you're going to see, OK? Yeah, because yeah. you have people... People could be wandering up the street in a car. We've had a situation where cars are coming very, very quickly and got into the property. Right. You have people who are off their faces walking around. You don't know if they've got weapons on them and things. So you're always thinking about what could happen. And, that, and that's the fundamental issue here is that you're worried about what, what could happen to you. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of mixture in the street in terms of, in terms of demographic. We've got pensioners, we've got children, we've got you know, young women and so on. Everybody's quite frightened about it. But it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem to, check, to, to, to deal with and to fix. I, I hear you. It's interesting, isn't it? The, 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 I mean, Starmer has actually, twice in a day I've referred to the Daily Express. I don't think I've, it's an extraordinary. He's written an article for them saying that as director of public prosecutions, I saw how antisocial behaviour can ruin lives. As prime minister, I will yeah. take tough action on yobs terrorising our streets. So t time will tell. But you highlight two things. The difficulty of dealing with it, if the person responsible is just determined not to make any effort or any change at all. The system runs out, r runs out of road, doesn't it? But the second bit is you're describing hypervigilance, I think. You're describing a psychological yeah. condition called hypervigilance when you're almost in a fight-or-flight mode all the time, not just in moments of emergency, because as you described it, it was as if the next emergency could be any minute now. Well, we, we all have, we've we probably got the most security cameras in these streets in, 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 our, in our borough, something like that. And we, we all talk, we've got a WhatsApp community. So we, we're talking to each other all the time. We're yeah. trying to provide evidence to the police constantly, but it's so difficult to actually get something resolved. And the, and the, the, the other problem, of course, is the fact these people own the property makes it... Yeah, no, we're good, yeah. so there's no it. landlords you can call on. Well, I feel for you, Peter, I really do. I, I, it's no consolation to you at all, but you've really helped convey the urgency of the situation, the seriousness of the situation. Thank you. The time now is 12 noon. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Four minutes after 12 is the time. Permanent justices are currently walking into the Supreme Court, into the International Court at The Hague and poised to give their ruling on calls for um, Israel to stop the Gaza conflict after South Africa has brought a case accusing them of genocide. 
um, we will keep an eye on that for you. And I don't because we don't know what the logistics of it will be, how long the ruling will take to read out. Might be really quick, might be pages, um, but we'll be keeping an eye on it and, and and covering it in depth throughout the day, no doubt, on LBC. Um, I've been ticked off a couple of times. I did just use the word Karen as a pejorative and um, and, and some quite compelling explanations of why I shouldn't have done. Susan says, um, I, I, I wish you wouldn't do that as I don't think there's an equivalent for men. And so us girls really do have quite enough slurs directed just for us. Um, as it is, and Ellie says, I, I disagree with Esther McVeigh as much as you do, but, but why call her a Karen? Are you unaware of the misogynistic undertones of that insult? I, well, I think I probably was, Ellie, actually. Um, but I'm not now, because Susan has pointed out that it's, it's an insult where there's no equivalent for men, which does make it sexist or, or misogynistic. So consider me, consider me educated. I, I, won't, I won't do that again. There's probably a reason why I've never done it before, actually. But it does, it does have that air to it, doesn't it, of, a, of a, an insult specifically directed at women. So um, my apologies. It is five minutes after 12. Uh, I... I, I, I don't know how long you've listened to this show. I can't, no, can, can I? But if if I told you that I used to be very like Ian Duncan Smith on a single specific subject, what subject do you think it would be? Uh, well, I, I, yeah, no, I'm sticking with that. That's how I'm described. I just felt a bit of shame then, as I said it. What subject, out of all the subjects under the sun that might come up relatively regularly on a radio phone-in program which one f has found me historically closest to ian duncan donuts position i might wait to see if i get any texts apparently the male equivalent of a karen is a kevin but i don't i don't i don't i don't think we'll go there i just think we'll just we'll just excise that from our um our lengthy list of, of of insults that we like to be equal opportunity so anyone can be a wazzock it's not it's not gender or sex specific um what subject if i said now there is one subject that we've done together over the years where i did on occasion find myself sounding worryingly like ian duncan donuts and the answer is marriage i i, I it's an enduringly fascinating subject for me and for the first time ever fewer than half of adults in this country are now married or in a civil partnership, official figures show. It's the first time they've counted since 2020, but it just dipped below in 2021, 50%. 49.7% of those aged over 16 were in a legal relationship. Um, and by 2022, it had fallen still further. It just dipped another 0.3 of a percentage point to 49.4%. The proportion of people in England and Wales living together in couples has remained about the same. So it just means that fewer and fewer people are bothering to formalise their partnership. Decline in marriage and civil partnerships, even as same-sex weddings have become a thing since 2013. So you'd have thought the numbers might actually have, have gone up a bit as, 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 um, as same-sex couples played catch-up, if you like. In, no, was it? Yeah, Joe says corporal punishment. That was a long time ago. I shouldn't have asked this question now. You're clogging up my inbox with your mischief again. I've, I don't know what Ian Duncan Donuts' views on tattoos are, George. But yes, mine used to be a little bit embarrassing. No, it's not speeding fines, and it's certainly not the death penalty, John. But it could have been corporal punishment, Joe. Um, I, although I have changed my, I've written a whole book about all the things I've changed my mind on. So I'm taking my. Um, there you go. Joe's got there in the end. Marriage is not like corporal punishment at all. You're damn right, Joe. So I, and I think I know why I have such a, or had such a Victorian, or, or, or prim, what's the word? What's the word like prim? What's that word that I'm looking for? So, so like a, a big, you know, pr, 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 not pompous, not prim, like a word to describe a sort of, my attitude to marriage was sort of a combination of old fashioned and judgmental. I would look down on you if you weren't married. What's the word? I'm a po faced? I can't remember. It'll come to me when you've texted it, as you will no doubt do in a moment to 84850. So I, 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 I'm mentioning this because not everybody's been listening to the program for as long as you have. I, I very much used to tell people, and I meant it, it was tongue in cheek because it was provocative, but it was sincere. I used to tell people that if they weren't married, if they weren't in a in a formal partnership, a civil either a civil partnership or a marriage, then their relationship was inferior to mine, which is quite a 
nearly used quite a rude word then, much ruder than the one I used earlier. It's quite a, it's quite a, I can't say the word I want to say now. It's quite a, it's quite a silly thing to do that. It's quite an obnoxious way to behave. Say, oh, well, you're not married. Your relationship is inferior to mine. But I never lie to you. And, and it, 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 it is how I feel. It, I do have a sense of confusion uh, why, if you've met the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, you wouldn't seek to formalise it. But I also, thanks to you, actually, I, I now have prissy, possibly was the word, or pious. Yeah, you're so much better at this than I am. Why don't we swap jobs for the day? You do the show, and I'll, and I'll, I'll send a helpful text to 84850. Prissy, I think, was the word I was looking for. But pious is arguably even better. I, I, I'm not going to combine prissy and pious, because I think that would be on the Ofcom band list. But I, I quite like the combination of prissy and pious. But I do genuinely believe it. So what you've given me over the years... Um, is, is cognitive dissonance. You've dressed me down for this. You've pointed out that my position is quite snobbish, perhaps, or unnecessarily obnoxious. But I can't change... It hasn't changed the way I feel. So on other issues like tattoos and corporal punishment, I've gone full 180. I'm now completely... Pos I'm possessed of completely the opposite position to the one that I had when I started this job. But I still have, even though all the things that you've told me over the years that should really have talked me down from this pious position on marriage and, and civil partnerships i still i've still got it and and i think i know why i think it is partly because of my wife i think that i love my wife so much that it has to have the relationship has to have some sort of stamp on it that no other relationship ever had it just feels to me like an announcement to the world and that might be an insecurity on my part but it feels to me as if not if you've really met the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, you, you want to formalise it. And if you don't want to formalise it, then you haven't met the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Priggish. Yes, priggish, prissy, pious. These are all great words, aren't they? I should have been able to come up with at least one of them. So so I'm just being completely honest with you because I, I, I think my opinion is quite offensive. To, to people who aren't neither married nor in a civil partnership. But I think it's really sad news that I'm now in a minority. I think it's really sad news that fewer than half of adults have made that public commitment, have made that public betrothal. Um, why haven't you? 0345 60973. If, if you've met the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, if you want to have a family with, if that's how you're minded, why on earth wouldn't you make a full and public commitment? Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 And I do like doing this occasionally. I can't do it too often because it, it becomes a little bit sort of hair shirt and, and self-flagellation-y. What's wrong with me? What's actually wrong with me? How, how can I sit here and genuinely hold my relationship as somehow being superior to yours because of a piece of paper or, or, a, or a church service? I, I can see that it's not. I really can. This is what I mean by cognitive dissonance. I know that it's not. Somewhere inside, I really know that it's not. But I, I, I think that it is. I know that it's not, but I think that it is. I sound like... I, 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 just doesn't make sense to me are you like me have you got it as well or are you better at it than me and you can actually explain why you think you're right to uh consider the relationship inferior a hierarchy of relationship value is what i'm describing a genuine hierarchy of relationship values and on this one i am simultaneously embarrassed by and committed to my belief why would you not want to have a marriage or a civil partnership. And if you fancy it, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with this position that I hold? Why, why am I convinced in my bones of something that in my brain I know to be unfair and even perhaps unkind? I'd add a couple of things. I have had messages over the years, including from a pal of mine, from people who have previously expressed quite profound unhappiness with my priggish prissy pious position and then subsequently for reasons they've got married and they said oh do you know what you were right I, I'm, I'm playing this card and i'm playing it shamelessly 
They've got back in touch with me. You know who you are. And they said, you know, I used to think you were a right pompous prig on uh, on that marriage issue. But we've actually done it now. And because the kids really wanted us to. And you're right. It is different. It does feel di- It does feel different. So what's going on? 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. I don't have contempt for people who aren't married. Don't be mean, whoever sent that text in. I categorically don't. But I p- p- possibly what I do have is worse than contempt. I've got pity. No one wants to be pitied. No one wants my pity. But I just genuinely feel that denying yourself this bond, this formal bond, is pitiable. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. James, get over yourself, says Tricia. Equal rights financially is a good thing, uh, a good reason to formulise things. Otherwise, meh, I'd feel sorry for you, Tricia. I don't know why, but I do. I know you don't want me to, and I know you don't think that I should, but there we are. So there's two topics here, one quite traditional in the annals of radio phone-ins. How important is marriage? Why on earth are you not in one? even though you're in a committed lifelong relationship, 03456060973. But then the second one, which is not really traditional in the annals of radio phone, what's actually wrong with me? James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh, yeah, thank you, Scott. I did used to use the phrase gold standard as well. It says, it, it text from a pal of mine, you used to say families were not gold standard if mum and dad weren't married. Well, that was the Catholic upbringing, and, and I'm open-minded enough to have rejected that and to also recognise how obnoxious it was. Remember that my biological parents weren't married when I, when I was born, so not only was I being obnoxious, I was being quite hypocritical as well. But, but I, I, I'm, fa- I'm fascinated by it, and, and you should be as well, it, just on a social level, this relationship between marriage and society, and why I think it's bad news that fewer than half of adults are married or civil partners, but I simultaneously know that it, it shouldn't matter. Um, Kate says, perhaps it's Catholic guilt, James, authorised sex versus unauthorised sex. I, I got over that bit of Catholicism quite early, Kate, without going into too much details. It didn't, it didn't once I was sort of 17, 18 years old, it ceased to be much of an issue for me that 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 sort of guilt but speaking of catholicism this 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 one really caught my eye mick and mark i'll be that sounds like we planned it i'll be with you imminently i promise my friend has refused my marriage invitation for april james as it is a civil ceremony and he is a pious catholic i do think he's a bleep for doing this that's a great word by the way i wish i could use it on the radio Uh, as someone from a catholic background yourself james do you think that this is okay because i can see a similarity here in attempting to value or put a hierarchy on other people's relationships no so i i acknowledge that i was an ass right but i wasn't as big an ass as him and i won't use that word again either now it's just just illustrative nowhere near as big a bleep as him because that's incredibly i'm not coming to your wedding as your friend because i disapprove of the mode of ceremony that you're having but it goes to show how multifaceted this conversation can be and do not let me go home without doing the brexit roundup okay it's a really good one mix in whittington in shropshire mick what would you like to say hello james um yeah, I've got quite a unique perspective on this. I seem to have I'll one of those quite a lot of different things. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I was brought up in care, and um, luckily I was uh, my, my, I was placed with the foster family, um, and that was a Church of England vicar uh, and his wife. Okay. Uh, quite lucky, really. I think I'm right in saying my dad was the first vicar in the UK to be ordained on the strength of a psychology degree rather than theology, so he had a bit of a different kind of take on, uh, yeah. on, on, on religion, and he certainly didn't believe in forcing it down anybody's throat and that sort of stuff. Hmm. Um, my mum has got quite sort of strong uh, Christian beliefs. My dad still has, but uh, but you know my mum believes in marriage and, and all this that and the other. So for many years, I thought that was going to be the journey for me, and that was the path in life, you know, to find somebody, um, settle down, get married, have children, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I've been with my current. Girlfriend, my girlfriend Sally. See, but, yeah, there um, you go. You see what you just did, though. You're proving that that's it. That's psych, mate. That's Freudian. That's in your well, mind, no. somewhere in your head. Poor Sally. Yeah, I hope no. she's not listening. Somewhere in your head, yeah. she's your current girlfriend. I don't say my current wife. No, I just think somewhere in Sally's head, she'd probably think you'd be damn lucky to find somebody else that'll take you on. Yeah, fair uh, so, I, you know, you I mean, we've been, together for, we've been together for been together for 15 years. And you know what? In the beginning, we I think we both sort of felt like that's the path we were going to go down. And then 
we yeah. just sort of came to the realization that we don't need a piece of paper to prove how we feel. Yeah. Um, and actually, we've seen ourselves stand the test of time. No, I know you're um, right, but I don't feel, I feel a lot of it in my people bones. Haven't. There's something wrong with my bones, Mick. It's seriously, well, I know you're right. I know you're right, but this is how I feel. That's, that's what conditioning is, isn't it? That's what... Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I, and I guess that's that's you know where you know where we were at the time, but we gave ourselves the freedom to just say, do you know what? Let's just not bother, and and, and the children are happy. Yeah, of course. And we're happy, and like I said, we've seen other people that have got married in that space of time that have got married and split up, and it's, it's all, all been nasty and horrible. Is um, are, you, are your parents comfortable with it? Are they still with us? Uh, well, my hey, listen, my dad's very, very sort of easy going. Yeah. Um, and he knows that kids are going to do whatever they're going to do. Mum, I think she would, you know, because I've not necessarily uh, been the most ordered person in life, um, but I think she, she probably sees that as the final piece of the jigsaw in her head. Yeah. Um, but actually, if she took a step back out of all that and looked at it and thought, do you know what? Actually, yeah, he's got two kids there. They're doing she great. Doesn't. She wants you know. to get married because she thinks that it's like cement. Yeah. I think that's yeah. what it is from your mum's point of view. Yeah. I can't believe I'm speculating on your mum's motivations, but she does. <laughs> so I don't, it's not a hyacinth bouquet thing. It's not because she's worried what the neighbours will think. Uh, hmm, well, you see, that's interesting. Cause, uh, <laughs> being, being, in the, being in the position of, uh, of the vicar's wife, I think there's always going to be yeah, you're right. a little bit of that. Yeah, there's probably. an added pressure socially and sort Maybe. of having a vicar's son that she did have uh certainly uh, no it's yeah, because yeah, you could problem. you know it doesn't make them look hypocritical but you could as a member of the congregation wonder why the the, the vicar's own boy hasn't got got married if it is such a big deal uh, but i like the sound of him he sounds like a, he sounds like the, the right kind of cleric thank you mick and, and we're 100 percent sure that sally doesn't want to get married are we one hundred percent. Well, you say that, mate. You say that. See, this is the point at which, back in the day, I would have become, I think, a little bit obnoxious. I think, because, and also possibly even a bit paternalistic, stroke misogynistic. Because I think I came from a place where I believed that w w women always want to get married, and men sort of resist because they they want to quote keep their options open or something like that. But maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I was projecting. Helen's in Colchester. Helen, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. <clears throat> Um, so I have been with my partner now for 34 years nearly, um, and we have never got married. Right. Um, Why not? Because it, it wasn't something that we wanted to do. I have, I have a bit of an issue with the phrase, the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Okay. Because that, that's quite a, um, a, an odd thing to say, I think, I think given you? You know, how, how... Well, I do a bit, because life is, is, is quite long. And, you know, situations change, people change. You know, every day I wake up and I know that I want to be with James and, mm. and not you, don't panic, um, with my James. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, and so that, that is where we stay. But I, I also, I have a question for you. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Why do you think it is a bad thing that you think your relationship is superior to everyone else's? Uh, not my relationship. But the but the formal but the so everybody's you so just someone just tuning in, I, I mean that by dint of being married because it's unfair on other people it's it's judgmental it's sanctimonious that's another good word, it, it, and and it's not true I mean there's no way that my because I'm married my relationship is stronger than yours it just doesn't make sense but I still believe it in some mad way. I, I, well, I'm not sure if that's the reason you believe it. I just Ooh. think you're where you need to be and. Because it's so brilliant, then then but it's how not. can anybody else who's not in the same position be be? Oh, I see what you mean. So in, yes. in such a such a strong way. Essentially, when you say you know what, what's wrong with me, I think it's not what's wrong with you. But what you're doing, James, is you're evangelising. Yes, I am evangelising. You know, and and people who people of faith who who have that faith and evangelise, they're doing it from the absolute best place because they've found the most wonderful thing, and they can't. Oh, okay, so you're being very generous to me. You're being very generous to me, but I'm coming at it from the other end of the telescope and recalling how hurtful my position used to be for people in your position. So obviously you'd never be offended by any nonsense that I came out with on the radio, but a lot of people were. I'm, I'm not offended by it because, because I, know. I know my relationship is, is the best. <laughs> so, yes. so, so no, no, nothing that you can say about it. So maybe it. I'm insecure rather than secure. Maybe me banging on about it all the time is, 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 I don't think I am insecure, but why would I care about what other people were doing in their relationship? 
Why would I care? Why do I? Why did I? It's a funny as one. I say, as I say, I, I honestly think when, when you've found something that you think is the best, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to present then that you, as so, the best. So that's a really lovely contribution. Thank you. So you're essentially saying if you're lucky enough to have found something wonderful, if you're a nice person, you'll try to encourage other people to find the lovely thing that you've found. Yeah. I really do think that. What a lovely call. Thank you. It made the entire conversation worthwhile. I mean, it was already worthwhile, but I'd never thought of it like that, that way round. Makes me feel a lot more comfortable with my... I might have to come up with some new words now, Helen. I, I can't... So it's neither priggish nor prissy or pious or, or any of those things. Instead, it's evangelical. It's an evangelizing zeal. But of course, as with all evangelizing, it's a little bit... Um, oh, I don't know if arrogance too strong a word but but the idea that oh if only you could be if only you had what i've got you'd be much happier and obviously that's not true because helen is the polar opposite relationship wise and and uh, absolutely happy it's a funny one isn't it how much of it is nurture then how much of it is drilled into us i wonder how many people who hold my position do have a um a, a kind of somehow religious foundation for it sarah writes i try to live by the policy that we should let others do as, as others wish. But raising kids is tough, and I think confirming the relationship provides security for all, and that helps. I also think it is something to be promoted and encouraged if children will be involved. I do too, Sarah, but I, I don't know if either of us would be able to um, properly and fully articulate it in the, in the sense of telling someone why they should when they haven't and they don't feel any need to it's coming up to half past 12 you are listening to james o'brien on lbc michelle says even though i'm catholic i don't think marriage is important it's just a contract for finance and chattels perhaps people change when they're married because of how others look at them others might think this is not your final relationship even if you do and that's um why the couple start saying my husband or my wife which marks them out as different there's a lot going on isn't there uh it's coming up to half past 12 amelia cox is here with your headlines James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 33 minutes after 12, that ruling in The Hague on whether or not Israel is committing genocide in Gaza is is underway. It's quite dense. We've got a, a lawyer uh, uh, following it for us. And as soon as there is digestible clarity, is the phrase I'm going for, digestible clarity, then we will hear from him. Um before that, we continue our conversation about marriage, but I am currently remembering that I have to give you a Brexit roundup, an extraordinary 24 hours in Brexit land, um, but one that I fear probably sets the tone for quite a lot of the traffic coming up in the future. But before that, back to marriage and this weird, very personal subject for me, uh, in that I, I know that it is not fair to think that if you're not married or in a civil partnership, then then there's something a bit wrong. I know it's not fair or true, but it's what I, I feel. So we're looking at the news that people who adults, now fewer than half of adults are married or in a civil relationship for the first time ever. Uh, it might go back up again. Some of it could be linked to lockdown and, and, and stuff, but I, I, I somehow doubt it. But also, in a very self-indulgent way, I'm, I'm inviting you to analyse me and, and, and people like me who subscribe to this school of thought, up to and including the, the, the silly fella who's not going to his own friend's wedding because it's a civil service rather than a, a, a church service. 12.34 is the time. Mark's in Worcester. Mark, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I've recently uh, binged all three of your books. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so uh, recently been switched off to yourself in terms of... Yeah, uh, so you've read radio, the chapter uh, on this subject then, haven't you? Well, yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. So this, this this was very much a subject that was quite close to my heart and I was interested to find out uh, by, by listening to you, it just so happens obviously very, very soon that you've actually talked about it again. Yeah, that's uh, funny. It, 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 interested to, to listen kind of where you stand on it now. And it's interesting that... So many of the other subjects that you had very strong opinions on, you kind of, you know, very you, you flexed. You've even gone 180, as you say. But but this, you're still quite strong on. Well, um, cognitive dissonance, mate. Really, is I know it's silly, but it, yeah. but it, but I'd be lying if I said I'd, I'd I'd had the same conversion that I have on some of those other issues that you've read about in how not to yeah. be wrong. Yeah, fair fair point. Fair point. Um, 
you want okay, so you, you, you want somebody to analyse where you are. How old were you? Were well, you no, I'm, you I'm more interested in what you think. I think. Oh well, no, okay. we can we can do it either way. So you you are you, you're in a relationship, but you feel um, no need at all to formalise it. I presume. I, 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 I have very, very passive views on marriage. I think if somebody wants to get married and it makes them feel happy, then, you know, that's <laughs> and I certainly... You might certainly as well just pat me on the head and give me a biscuit at this point, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> you crack on, mate, with your marriage, you weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. You know, for certain people, they have very strong views about it. Yes. I certainly wouldn't not go to a friend's wedding. Uh, because that because it was uh, you know I certainly would not go to a friend's wedding either Ever. because it was a, you know, yeah no 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 I would always if a friend invites me to a wedding of course I'm going F- for me myself I you know I I've had several long term relationships my girlfriend we've been together almost seven years now mm. um, she's been married before she's got children by a previous uh, relationship by yeah. by, by her, her ex husband um, you know they they lasted however long they lasted they they, they divorced you know. I've seen so much divorce in people close to me. Yes. Uh, sadly, my mum died when I was young. I'm my sorry. dad remarried. Right. Uh, got divorced, remarried again, got divorced. You know, so and and I've got several friends whose relationships, who, sorry, whose marriages haven't even lasted anywhere near as long as yeah. my my girlfriend's relationship. You know, um, in terms of commitment. We, we bought a house together, which is, as you'll appreciate, a, a big financial commitment. It's a, um, it's a much bigger commitment than a marriage. Yeah, well, I mean, that, and, that, and that's kind of thing. That's where I'm. If my girlfriend turned around to me and said she wanted to get married, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I pro- I'd do it for her. You know, I yeah. have no. If it mattered to her, I would do it for her. But, but your needle wouldn't move at all. You're, in terms of enthusiasm versus ambivalence, you'd be just straight down the middle just a piece of paper and, mm. a, and, a, and a reason to have a party <laughs> you know yeah well that's, that's not a bad rationale at all so go on then do do the other bit why, why, why did you want to know how old i was what was the question you were going to ask so i, I mean i'm 43 now yeah. and my girlfriend have been together since i was 36 37 um you know so and, and like i say you know she she's had kids in a pre- previous yeah. relationship uh c- can't have kids anymore right. even if we wanted them um, and you know, I, I, I appreciate when people meet it when they're younger. Yeah, maybe. So we, were, I was twenty six when married. I met my wife. Yeah. Got married quite very quickly, actually. Twenty seven, I think. Twenty seven. And, uh, and and there's that air. Wanted of, a family. Uh, that air of uniqueness to it. You know, if you haven't had that those long term relationships, if you haven't already got the kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, <laughs> what what about this from Frank? See how you, think you get on with this, Frank's in Ealing. He says, "Not being married feels like you're on loan at a football club, and they're not prepared to make you a permanent signing." <laughs> <laughs> Of course it doesn't, though, does it? Because it's a mutual arrangement. Frank's positing the notion of one partner really wanting it and the other one not. I think, I, and again, this is what I mean by cognitive dissonance. Your attitude sounds much healthier than mine, but I can't help, I can't help the attitude that I've got. 12.39 is the time. Right, I, I'm going to do this. Nikki, I'm sorry. I, I hopefully we'll be able to squeeze you in, but I do want to do this properly. This is all, this is, and my thanks to Edwin Hayward, um, who wrote Slaying Brexit Unicorns for putting this all together. This is all pretty much in the last 24 hours, okay? The UK has uh, given up on negotiations to extend our trade deal with Canada, uh, which leaves us worse off than when we were an EU member. So, Kemi Badenoch was kind of hoping to uh, secure some sort of arrangement that would see us have the same deal in place that we had as EU members. I think it had originally been rolled over. And now they're actually, you know, a push has come to shove. So you're looking at 245% tariffs on cheese, Stilton, cheddar, other British cheese imports. That'll kick in. Um, that has kicked in already at the start of the month. They're also planning additional tariffs on British car exports. that will come in in April. Um, uh, it, it's essentially Canada doing what happens in trade agreements, which is exerting weight and the heavier country will exert the most weight or or not country of course crucially it's a market so there you go these negotiations have been underway since 2022 and it was claimed at the time that it would help more than 10,000 small and medium-sized businesses in Britain but um uh, well, it's all gone wrong on that one. The That's one story. We've got new border checks coming in, which are estimated to cost £200 million 
pounds a year in terms of food and drink. You'll remember Jacob Rees-Mogg talked about these Brexit checks when he was still being treated I mean, incredibly, when people were still taking him seriously as a politician. Here's a little reminder. I thought post-Brexit checks were not going to be disruptive. That's why we're not uh, adopting them. This uh, would have been an act of self-harm if we'd gone ahead with it. It would have increased costs for people. So they are going ahead with it because they have to, whether J-Dog understood that or not um, uh, uh, at the time is immaterial. So that is going ahead and it is an act of self-harm and it is estimated to cost about 200 million quid. MPs have been warned that holidaymakers driving to Europe face queues of up to 15 hours or more in Kent when the new rules for Britons travelling to the European come into force later this year. Um, There's even been warnings and hopefully this won't come true, of possible shortages of flowers for Valentine's Day as a consequence of these new incoming border checks. They land, as Pete Foster explained to us earlier this week, at the end of this month. Um, French homeowners or the owners of second homes in France have been dealt a blow after uh, a a state authority quashed their exemption from onerous restrictions on the time they can spend in the country. The Daily Mail, perhaps inevitably, had reported that the precise opposite result was expected to be delivered but that has um, uh, that has essentially meant that British citizens with second homes in France cannot stay there for more than 90 days. Um, that that uh, original arrangement, as with Canada, has expired and doesn't look like it will be renewed. Um, I, I haven't finished yet. Rishi Sunak's pledged to ensure that no future laws can create a border down the Irish Sea has upset some unionists. It's all designed to try and get Stormont back up and running, but it's also in future so-called Brexiteers like Ian Duncan Smith and others, even though it is probably the only way in which to get Northern Ireland government back on track. And finally, the EU has um, uh, revealed plans to increase its bulk medicine procurement. So the bloc moving as one to secure medicines at a time, as we know, of international shortages. And of course, because the EU has much greater buying power than the UK does, this is feared by experts, predicted by experts, Um, to uh, exacerbate the problems in this country. So there you have it. That is just in the last 24 hours. A trade deal with Canada is back on ice and tariffs on cheese and sundry other British exports have gone through the roof. The thing that Jacob Rees-Mogg described as an act of self-harm is happening at the end of the month and estimated to cost 200 million quid. Uh, MPs have been warned by experts in the field that we could be looking at delays of up to 15 hours for Uh, or queues of up to 15 hours for holidaymakers trying to make their way out of Britain into continental Europe. Possible shortages of flowers for Valentine's Day. Uh, French homeowners, uh, owners of second homes in France, will not be able to extend their visas from 90 to 180 days after the France's Constitutional Council Court handed down a decision on which there is no right of appeal. Rishi Sunak has tried to get Stormont back up and running in Northern Ireland, but in so doing has upset the continuingly delusional Brexiters in his own party. And finally, we are going to be a very small player in the global pharmaceuticals medicine procurement market because the EU is uh, developing plans to act more cohesively across the entire block. But remember, everybody knew exactly what they were voting for. We have taken back control, and this is what controlling our borders looks like, or something. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12 minutes to one, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Sam Foles is a barrister who has advised on issues around genocide in the UK and internationally. He has been watching this judgment at the International Court in The Hague very closely, um, considering a, a case brought by South Africa alleging that Israel had embarked upon genocidal behaviour, and, and Sam joins us now. Sam, what can you tell us? Um, well, it's... It was a judgment full of, of twists and turns. The first, the b- first big headline is the court found that it was plausible to say that Israel is breaching the terms of the Genocide Convention in respect of Palestine. So it is plausible that South Africa says uh, that Israel is, is committing a genocide or genocidal acts. Gosh. Now, that is not the same as saying Israel has committed genocide, it's a, but it's saying it's plausible, it's arguable. That was the first big headline. 
South Africa would have then expected to what, uh, th that it would follow that the court would order a ceasefire. And that's what South Africa asked for. Yes. And the court didn't. The court in, uh, declines to order a ceasefire and instead made six uh, six orders uh, for I Israel or, or, or six one order with six provisions right. um, that essentially so, uh, order Israel to do everything ex in its power to prevent the commission of, of genocidal acts, to ensure that the IDF uh, doesn't commit any prohibited act, uh, to punish people that do, um, to allow necessary aid and to preserve evidence and to submit a report about all of this to the, the court within one month. Now, what's surprising about that is with the exception of the, of the last bit, the providing a report, yes. Israel already has to do all of those things. So it's already bound by the Genocide Convention. It already has, uh, has a legal duty to not commit genocidal acts, to punish people that do, to restrain its forces. So after coming forward with a very significant criticism of Israel and finding that it's plausible, it's breaching the convention, mm. it was then a very restrained, and, and I think South Africa would argue weak, uh, order that followed it. And is this a holding position, Sam, or is this the end of the issue? No, this is very much a holding position, and it'll be a holding position for a long time. This was simply an interim hearing. Yes. Um, so, and the 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 court made made it very clear on several occasions that the determination on whether Israel has actually committed acts of genocide is for the merits hearing, and that's not likely to happen probably for a matter of years. Crikey. So this is a case that will run on for a long time. Um, the the point of this hearing was to say, number one, is it is it pl uh, plausible that there may be breaches? I.e., is this worth carrying on with? Is it is it worth investigating? Is it a real issue? Right. And also, do we need to do something to alleviate the immediate danger to Palestinians? And the court answered yes to both of those questions, without really, as you've explained it specify i mean not really demanding any new actions from israel in order to ensure well, that they are doing the thing that the court has told them to do as you say they're, they're already required to do all the things that they've been told to do except submit a report which sounds in the great scheme of things relatively unimportant well yes and i think the the report will obviously provide another opportunity for the, the court to review this but what israel will say well is well we're doing all these things. Israel's mm. position is that we are complying with international law. We're complying with the Genocide Convention. So, yes, we're perfectly happy to take all measures necessary to comply with the Gen uh, Genocide Convention because that's what we've been doing all of this time. So this is it's arguably a case that, that both sides could claim victory from. Here. And probably will, I, I, except for one wrinkle that occurs to me, which is that if, I mean, Israel's position probably will be as you describe we will continue to take all measures to prevent genocide but if the court has found that the genocide accusation is plausible then it it it, it would be quite easy to argue well you clearly haven't taken enough measures because if you really had taken all measures to prevent genocide the court wouldn't have found the genocide accusation mm. as plausible yes and i think that's uh, potentially the the point that israel's allies are mm. going to find find themselves under pressure on because this yeah. This case, realistically, was always about Israel's allies, arguably more than Israel. Yes. Um, the Israeli government has said they described the court, the ICJ, today as a kangaroo court. And so right. there's, there's been a sort of level of disrespect from the Isra Israeli uh, um, administration, although they did comply with the, and engage with the process in, in full and in good faith. But it's the US, it's the UK, it's Germany... Um, it's all, all of all of these states will now be saying, well, there, there has been this finding that it's plausible Israel are, are, are breaching the convention. There has been a finding that there is a real and immediate danger to Palestinians. Politically, this becomes much more difficult to justify domestically for those states. Um, and uh, uh, on the ground, then, in the in the short term, there won't be any particular changes in what Israel is doing in Gaza. But the but the but the pressure being brought to bear by allies may change the long-term picture 
Yes, I think possibly one thing in the short term is that allies will put significantly more pressure on Israel to allow in necessary aid. Yes. And that is one of the points that's, uh, that's in the order. And it's sort of, it's almost politically the easiest to do mm. for, uh, um, for, for allies that to, to really focus on that. Um, difficult to argue that, uh, that Palestinian civi- civilians shouldn't be entitled to that, that aid. And that's a way for uh, st- uh, states in the West to, uh, to, look, to, to appear to com- comply with the order and to pe- appear to take note and sort of satisfy political pressure, while at the same time maintaining their, their diplomatic position of respecting what they call Israel's need to defend itself. And, and finally, Sam, c- could the court have handed down a stronger judgment? Or was it only ever going to be plausibility or not? It could only ever at this side uh, time decide on plausibility. Yes, that's so what it, I thought. I just wanted to never clarify. in a position to to to, to make it because as, because as you substance. say that, that that's that that can only be concluded years hence. Um, indeed, Sam Fowles, Many thanks indeed. Uh, did I pronounce your surname correctly, Sam? Sorry. Yes, perfectly. Did, oh, good. I'm glad to hear. It. I also noticed when I was very professionally doing a little bit of research before. Um, uh, you came on the program that you acted for John Nicholson in his battle with Nadine Dorries over over her claim that liking tweets was an act of bullying. I did, yes. Um, we're very pleased that uh, John was was completely cleared in the in that case because it was a, a a huge issue for free speech there. Indeed, with it was. That, that a you know a, sh- a shadow minister who criticised a a secretary of state could could then be accused of of bullying simply simply for liking tweets that were critical of her. And, uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you very much indeed. What a small world this is. I should have retained him when she was tweeting vile things about me, actually. It could have, uh, could have paid for my new kitchen. Uh, speaking of um, uh, interesting people, James Blunt is the guest on Full Disclosure this week, and I think he's wonderful. Uh, it's a tricky interview. I'd be love to know what you think about it. I don't often care what you think about it. I just want you to enjoy it. But the first 10 minutes, he, it was like I was pulling teeth. I had to keep reminding myself he wants to be here. He wants to be. He's just really uncomfortable in that an, an interview context. And then happily it, it, it sort of settled into it, warmed to the task. And, and we had a really, really lovely time. He is an absolutely fascinating man. And there's another extraordinary moment now, isn't there? Because you decide to record the record in L.A., the, 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 the first record in L.A., um, back to Bedlam, and and you end up living with Carrie Fisher yeah, in Los I, Angeles. Yeah, I'm mind blowing to, to be living with her. Well, it's called the book's called loosely based on, on a made up story, but that's actually entirely true. Yes, um, I just, I mean, I'm talking about 99 percent of it's true. There's yes. only maybe one moment. Very, that very loosely based. Yes, on, it, yes. Yeah. The, 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 the made up bit is very loose. The, the, the made up is very obviously not made yes. up because, yes. yeah, um, exactly. We won't go into it here. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, how extraordinary to find yourself living with Carrie Fisher, and at that stage, that's going to really make you believe you can achieve anything. What did she like about you? Um, I think we were both very well. You know what? First of all, she's a very generous human being. Yes, um, she adopted people, didn't she? A bit. Basically, yes. Yeah. Um, particularly, you know, those she she was a drug addict herself, and yes. she was very open about that. And people with drug addictions, she would invite in and, and care for and look yes. after. With me, when we met, she said, "You know, where are you? What are you doing? Where, where you know, what, what's your life all about?" And I yeah. said, "I've left the army, got a record deal, moving to Los Angeles." She asked me where I was going to live, and I said, "I, I haven't organised that yet." And she literally said, "Come and live with me." For the first month, we didn't really speak. Right. I was just out in the studio, and I'd come back late at night, and I never really saw her and then she had an episode she's a manic depressive and she had a bipolar um, and she had an absolute episode they were talking about her her staff were talking about her in front of her um and and it was a bizarre moment to watch and uncomfortable but but suddenly seeing her have this episode i could really relate to what was going on in her brain and suddenly that openness um between between her and myself yeah became apparent and we just found we could talk for hours proper intimacy Absolutely, Had and you from had completely that different backgrounds. You... Not really. No. I mean, I suppose maybe with you know your mate when you're 14 and you have a dream and you're going to sure. you know and form a band and you're going to be. But those are such childish um, ambitions and dreams, and, and that's why you have those intense friendships as children. Yes, sure. Um, but it was uh, amazing to be an adult and have that intensity of conversation with someone as well, so open. And someone who'd lived so much, when in, in a yeah. sense you'd lived a lot, but you were starting a new life at yeah, this point. Yeah, absolutely. And to therefore be so open as to not be afraid to say the things that you shouldn't say to anyone else. You know, you're, the things you're genuinely most embarrassed about. Yeah. Um, uh, the things you, you know, you know, 
just the things that you just wouldn't share with anyone. They're your private, yeah. private thoughts. And I write about it in the book, saying, you know, where she knows where every body is buried. In that she really did. I mean, she, we were very, very open. Um, because you'd seen her naked. Yeah, emotionally, exactly. You felt you could totally. bear yourself the, the, to her. The shame and humiliation with which she had to deal with having yeah. a, a, yeah. a sort of breakdown in front of other people and them talking about her. We just felt we were we could be very open. Um, she left a huge hole in your life, I think. Yeah, and in many, and as you and say, in many, other in many people, others, it's funny bumping into other people who will will talk as passionately about her as I do. Um, just a really, really interesting man. A fascinating interview. The producers say, crikey, he's posh. And uh, at the beginning of his career, he was offered a record deal on the proviso that he toned his accent down. And he walked out of the room. I like people who are comfortable with their class, probably because I spent almost all of my life until relatively recently not knowing what, what class I belonged to and desperately trying to fit in everywhere. I, I like the security of people who are comfortable with their class. I liked everything about him. It's a really good interview. Check it out. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thank you, James. James O'Brien on LBC.